Daddy, you go crazy. DJ UTV, let them know who we got in the building. Hey, my name is Rwanda. Rwanda, what you want, gang? I just came here to just set some shit straight. Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> I've been trying to get my true story told to the public for over 27 years. Mm. And now with all this shit going on with the young lady that just got murdered, it's time for me to tell my story because it was almost like that. Oh, wow. Well, welcome to DJU TV. Thank you. An interesting story you have indeed. Um, and thank you for coming to share it with us. Yes. Um, I could tell from the moment we talked on the phone that it was something that you 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 need to get off your chest. Yes. I'm on it. Okay. You know, um, and just to let the viewers know, me and Rwanda had a three minute phone call cut off. I said we'll talk about it when you come sit on the couch. Yep. So we're gonna start with where you from, Rwanda. All right, I'm from Chicago, so I'm like everybody else is supposed to be sitting on this couch. That's I'm right. from Chicago. I'm from over there on P Street, or Parnell Street off of 71st. And um, I grew up in Inglewood all my life. Um, we, we never moved out of Inglewood to any other areas in the, cis, in the uh, city. Um, we were poor, struggling like everybody else. And um, my mother had a, a dry cleaning business in the area. So we had a dry cleaning business and that's helped me to go to college. I went to college, got a criminal justice degree and decided in college that I would uh, join the Chicago Police Department. Okay. Um, so, so taking it back though, you know, growing up, you, you say your mom had a dry cleaning business. Yes. Um, can you just tell us how like the streets of Chicago were at that time? Was it like the way it is now, like as far as gangs and stuff like that? Oh, no. When I was growing up in Chicago, it was just such a beautiful place. I mean, like every year we would look forward to going downtown on Michigan Avenue, seeing all of the decorations for the holidays and different things like that. And you could pretty much uh, just go outside, play. It was no gun play like it is. You know, the kids can't play outside because it could possibly get hit, you know, by uh, random shots or whatever. But it wasn't like that when I grew up in Inglewood. Uh, there's an apartment building at 7,000 South Parnell. is a tall apartment building. I think it's six or seven floors. We lived in that building. And so um, we just played outside beyond the street lights coming on. It was just a real nice thing. And, and um, the people on our block, everybody knew each other. And so if you did something wrong, they would correct you and, you know, deal with things like that as a community. Now, when I joined the Chicago Police Department, I purposely worked. I asked to work that area because I wanted to give back to where I came from. Mm -hmm. So I was a police officer on the beat uh, where I had grown up. My babysitter from when I was young, she lived on, the, on my beat, um, classmates and all of that. So it was a real sense of community for me. Right. Yeah. Okay, and taking it uh, to, the, to the part where um, you went to college and got a degree in criminal, criminal justice. justice. Um, out of all the things you could have done after graduating college, what made you decide to uh, take up the police force as an occupation? Well, like most young girls, whatever, I got pregnant. Okay. And so uh, my original plan was after I graduated with my criminal justice degree from Chicago State, I was going to go to um, law school and I got pregnant and I got scared because I didn't know how I was going to handle all of that. But I knew that the P Chicago Police Department was hiring, so I knew I would be able to, you know, g get a job. But going to law school, it just seemed like something I needed to defer at that time. Mm -hmm. But that's how I ended up on the Chicago Police Department. They were doing this re uh, really nice recruiting campaign or whatever. And so a lot of people that I went to college with, we all joined the Chicago Police Department together. Okay. Yeah. So you and a lot of other African Americans? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so so tell us about when you joined. Um at the time the superintendent he there was an African American male, correct? Yeah, Leroy Martin, I wanna say? Yeah. yeah. Leroy Martin. I think he got taken down for some corruption or whatever. 
But to know that there, so there actually was a um, African American presence yes. within the Chicago Police yeah, Department. Yeah, the the uh, presence of women was not as accepted at that time. Um, when I was in the police academy, you know, the men, the men cadets, and the males that were already officers, they really didn't want women on the job. So they would do anything they could while you were in the academy to try to sabotage you, where you would end up having to quit different yeah. things like that. So I went through a lot when I was in the police academy with people trying to uh, hurt me so that I, you know, would have to quit. Uh, they made us fight men. You know, we had to fight men. It wasn't no sugarcoating it. If you was going to get on this job, you had to do it just like a man. Yeah. And so um, it, it, we had to prove ourselves. And I went, when I got out of the police academy, and I went to District 7 on 61st and Racine. No, no, nobody really wanted to work with me because I was so small. I think I was about 98 pounds, 105 pounds at the most or whatever. And so in my uniform, I just looked like a glorified uh, crossing guard. That People would say, look at that crossing guard with that gun, you know. And I was actually a police officer, but they couldn't really, like, picture that because I was so petite so feminine and all of that kind of stuff but anyway the men didn't want to work with me and i had to prove prove myself so i remember the the first guy that was willing to work with me he um, was a former boxer and so what we would do is we worked the third shift which was the afternoon shift that starts around three and he would drive around and they had just passed an ordinance where the gang where people couldn't congregate on the corners and so we would just be going around telling the people, get off the corner, get off the corner. And I was wondering why he kept doing that over and over and over again. But he was sizing up the people that were out there looking for a candidate for me to fight. fight. And so he found the guy, whatever, and he put him in the back of the squad car and he pulled us around an alley somewhere, told me to take my belt off and all that stuff. And me and the guy got to scrap him. Mm. And I was, you know, fighting for my life because I wouldn't go let him kick my ass. Right. So, but yeah, so that's how I proved myself. And uh, when I was a police officer, I was, I had a reputation on the streets for being uh, violent. They used to call me gladiator. I carried a seven cell, um, seven cell D cell mag light. That's steel light because, um, I was so small, people would try to steal on me all the time and just, you know, ch uh, challenge me. And the first time somebody saw me fight, and um, ap after that, I never had a problem no more. I had a fight with a lady up at 71st and Parnell. It was a, it was a tavern. And my partner, the same guy that was teaching me how to fight, we were um, trying to deal with a domestic disturbance inside. And this big, wide lady kept on coming over there um, while we were frisking a, sus a suspect uh, and I told her that she needed to move away let us do what we were doing and so she cussed fuck you bitch I'll come over there and, and kick your motherfucking ass you know and I'm like you come over here you're gonna get your ass kicked so she just kept on kept on and then next thing I know she came and she just swung on me and I got away from her swing and then I pulled down my light came up hit the bitch on her chin and Jen just got the welding on her right in front of the fire station. And I went into a zone because I was just so tired of all of that. You, you got to prove yourself stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the firemen were across the street because it was right across from the fire station. They were like, do you need any help? I'm like, no, this bitch do. But anyway, long story short, she had a pumpkin head when we was finished. You know what a pumpkin head is, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pumpkin head delight. They call it a PhD. Yeah. Yeah. Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Courtesy of Rowan. Yeah. But yeah, so after that, I never had any more problems mm -hmm. where everybody knew that I could fight. And then, like, when we would, when I was a police officer, I had the GDs and the BDs on our beats. And so they would be beefing all the time, shooting each other, killing each other, and all that kind of stuff. So having to deal with uh, what's going to happen after the, fun the funeral. It was always known, like when you would go to roll call and they said, you know, such and such funeral is today, it's going to be hot on that block. And so you look in at that block and you hear the calls. And so everybody know that if people get a call over there, you go all go over there, you know, and try to help 
keep everything cool and stuff like that. But yeah, every time somebody would get killed, they would be, you know, beefing and everything like that. So uh, I remember that a young, a young cadet that had just got out the academy, uh, the people attacked him and I was working with a female, another female, two of us, and um, they had him down on the ground trying to take his gun. And we jumped in and we beat their ass so bad. They was just screaming, please get these women off us because we fucked them up. Just doing whatever we had to do. But back then, that's the way police work was. You didn't pull no gun out on people. You fought. Mm -hmm. And that's why it was important for my partner to teach me how to fight because we, we went through use of force training and all that kind of stuff. But the policing that we did, we used everything up before we reached that point. We ain't had no tasers. We ain't had none of this old coward shit that they got right now that they ain't even using. When I was the police, we didn't even have that. We had no tasers. You had your billy club, your flashlight, and your gun. And I used to carry four guns. Damn. Four guns. Because it was, it was bad. I mean, it was bad. Chicago ain't no joke. It was bad back back then. It was nice when I was growing up, but when I got so like on the police court. department, my eyes became open. Yeah, which was the year 1986 when you joined yes, the force, Yes, when I joined the Chicago Police Department. So even back then, the GD and BD war was a thing. Oh, yeah. And like I said, I had them both on my block. And so it was just common, you know, that you was going to have to deal with them in some kind of way. The thing that I think made... 7 District, in the Inglewood District, um, unique was because of the different gangs there. And so I was part of a program that um, the Chicago Police Department implemented to try to deal with the violence. It was called Community Policing. It was under CAPS. Yeah, okay. those was the acronym, C-A-P-S. Okay. Chicago, Chicago Alternative Policing Style or something like that. Right. And so I was one of the original officers that was chosen to help implement that because we were testing it. And what it was essentially was one of the best programs to me ever in okay. terms of bringing the community and the police department together. Okay. So what I would do is something that a whole bunch of these coward ass police officers could never say that they could do. I walked my fucking beat. Okay. They, they gave us in that program, they told us that the requirement for that program was for you to get out of your square car, you know, you park and get out of it and walk through the neighborhood, introduce yourself to the people. The people have a right to know who you are. And so you, you're supposed to introduce yourself to the people. You talk to them. They tell you what their problems are, what the things they're concerned about. And you, as a liaison, you take that back to the police department and you distribute those complaints to the different departments with the city of Chicago that can resolve them. Part of that um, program was that you, as the beat officer, you would participate in, in organizing a monthly meeting where the community would come every month and just talk about what's going on in the community. Now, when do you hear stuff like that going on no more? You know, it's like the, the communication between the community and the police department is so separated. It's on two ends of the earth. And part of that is because of that damn squad car. A lot of them will not get out the car and speak to the people, talk to the people or whatever. It's like, I, I, I really just don't get it. For me, it was easy to walk my beat. And I had beat 732, and I walked that whole beat. Everybody knew me. They used to call me Mary J, like Mary J. Bly. That was my street nickname, Mary J, Mary J. And I worked, I worked my beat. Whatever they told me that they wasn't you know, happy with, I took it back to the police department. Man, I was getting rave reviews from the uh, upper echelon and everything like that, seeing how good of a job I was doing. Now, the officers that I worked with, they didn't embrace it with that same passion and enthusiasm that I did. I mean, I loved it. And I'm the type of person, if you tell me to do something, I'm going to do it. That's just me. I didn't want to just be coming to work, collecting a check, which is what a lot of them just do, because that's the only job I ever had where you didn't have to do shit and you still was going to get paid and retire and get your pension. The people that get fucked over are the people that's out there actually working. So 
taking us from the community policing strategy that I was a participant of takes us to where my story begins. Um, while I was out there making all those contacts and connections with the community, I got information on how the drugs was being brought in, how the guns was being brought in. And when I say information, I mean detailed information, cars, license plates, and all that kind of stuff. Got information on where the drugs was being distributed. When I say that, I mean detailed distri distribution. Um, Parnell, on Parnell, you got Hamilton Park. These damn drug dealers and everything was able to have their drug meetings in the Park District Fieldhouse every first Sunday or every second Sunday without any problem. They would be all in there and you couldn't even, the, the parking lot would just be filled with all of their cars. And it was known that that was what they was doing in there. Now, how the hell drug dealers gonna get to utilize the Park District Fieldhouse? Right. Yeah. Who, who, how, the, how the fuck that happened? So anyway, that's on my beat. So part, so people complaining to me because they want to be able to walk. You know how people, old people like to walk and all that kind of stuff. And Hamilton Park is a beautiful park. I used to be in those gym shows and stuff like that when I was little. So anyway, I took that to the police department, I, to my supervision. And I told them what was going on. I wrote out a report and told them exactly what was happening. And I asked for the tactical unit to come uh, on a Sunday so they could observe what was going on. They ain't do nothing with that shit. They just, I guess, took my report and just fouled it away. And I didn't catch it. I, I, I was so green and naive. I, I just didn't know that it was that much corruption Mm -hmm. in the police department. So that was like the first hint that something was wrong. Cause I'm like, how are these people able to do this? Mm -hmm. Then the next thing was somebody had told me about how the drugs was coming in, how the gun, no, how the guns was coming in. It was two vehicles. One vehicle would come like on a Tuesday and take their orders and all that kind of stuff. And he was in a fancy car, you know, the license plate number and all that. He was in the fancy car. He would come, find out what they want. Then on Sunday, he come in this old beat up station wagon and deliver them. I'm giving them all this detailed information and they still didn't do nothing with that. So remember I said that I um, was working on the blocks with my babysitters when I was little, you know, I would go to their houses for lunch. They would invite me for lunch. I mean, it was a beautiful relationship. So I'm in, in one of my um, friend's house and we in her kitchen and we looking outside and she was like, I'm so tired of these people selling these drugs in this alley behind me, behind my house. I can't even go to my garage. I'm scared and all this kind of stuff. So I'm like, well, let's look out here and show me what you're talking about. And so she sh showed me, I see it, the whole thing. I said, I'm going to call it in from your house and get them the exact location where everything hidden and all that. We're going to see what's going to happen. This was where everything went south for me and my career, and I almost lost my life. Okay, cool. Let's stop there. What year is this? 1995? This is 1994. 1994. Yeah. Okay. So it's 1994, and at this point, you've been working for the Chicago police for eight years. Yes. And you've just started to notice that something ain't right. You've been right. seeing things, you've been reporting things, and nothing's happening. Right. So you report, uh, you call in some drug dealers mm -hmm. from your friend's uh, apartment. Yeah. And, 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 and you told us okay. things went downhill from there. Yeah, things went da downhill from there. Here's the deal, okay. I called, I called in a um, complaint on her behalf. My squad car sitting in front of her house. I'm in her house, full uniform. This was a working day for me or whatever. I tell the operator that um, I needed a tech team or somebody to come over to uh, catch the guys. I gave all their descriptions, where they stash was at and all that kind of stuff. So they said they were sending a unit. So she and I were just looking through the window, you know, like anybody else waiting, you know, we looking through the cracks, waiting to see what was gonna happen. What happened was when the 
officers responded, it wasn't the type of response that I assumed it would be. They high-fiving these guys, hitting them. It was just totally inappropriate. Hmm. So I recognized who it was. And so I told, I told her name was Miss Curtis. I told Miss Curtis, I said, I got a report that she, she begged me. She said, please, please, please don't say nothing. Don't say nothing. Don't say nothing. I said, no, you got a right to enjoy your property and enjoy the neighborhood. We tired of this shit. She begged me and I just wouldn't listen. And so I reported it. The day I made that report, my whole police career just took a whole different trajectory. I was um, in line to be promoted to be a sergeant. I lost all of that. You reported seeing the other officers, seeing the other officers the drug doing, dealers, yeah. smoking weed with them, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. So when you reported that, that's when you became what they call a whistleblower? No, the whistleblower didn't come until I reported it to a higher level. Okay. So okay. let's talk about how I reported it. Okay. What I initially did was went into the station, reported it to my watch commander and to the lieutenant in the tactical unit. They had me to write, um, a, a, you, it's called an RO, you write reporting officer's report. So I, was, I wrote the reports, I gave it to them or whatever. I had no idea that the people that I reported to was part of that problem because the guys that came out there to respond worked for them. So I'm thinking that you just going to discipline them or whatever. I had no idea that they was going to share that I had made the report and then what would take place over the course of the few, next few months to, that would lead to a shootout on 79th and Western and rush out with traffic with internal affairs. Mm -hmm. That's how, that was my last day on the police department. Wow, so, uh, wow. So a call from your friend's apartment from yep. seeing some drug dealers led to what they call a Wild West shootout. Right. Okay. Right. Um, so and feel in the middle of all of that. Okay, like after I made that, that report, I noticed that when I, would ret when I returned to work, and I worked by myself. Let me clarify that too. They call it 99. I was a 99 unit and most officers aspire to work in the same area. And so for me being 732 was a real good accomplishment because that means that I can sow my talents and sow my abilities into this one geographic area. I'm not all over. And so that's how I was able to have uh, a lot of information like on the guns and the drugs and stuff because I worked that same be every day and that's that was critical to it because that's how you get your intel is by working it every day mm -hmm. but um yeah so the people that i reported it to ultimately in the end were the um people that were involved in it and then let me just insert this for a minute when this stuff was happening to me i've always been the type of person I, I believe that you can solve more problems with an ink pen or a typewriter or computer than you can with your fist or whatever so i'm i always would document everything so when this stuff would happen to me i would document everything and then i would report it but i would keep my copies and stuff when i started realizing that people knew that i had made that report my Tires on my squad car got slashed. So I would have these strange flat tires all the time. I noticed that when I would call for help, for backup, nobody would come. And I mean, that's serious. And this know? was like immediately it, after the... It was like, I, I won't say immediately, I would say like two or three days. You know, that's when I began to see right. stuff was happening like that. Right. So over the next few, over the next, let's say, 40 days or whatever, it was just continued in that pattern. Things continued down that path where it was a routine where I could call for backup and wasn't getting it. And I figured out that those were the reasons why. So fast forwarding from that point, because that happened in like November, December. So from November all the way to April, I just been under constant little threats and harassment or whatever. But on April 26th of, 90, of 94, 
April 26 of 94, a person flagged down my sergeant and told my sergeant that the uh, drug dealers had put a hit out on me. Okay. And so I just want to read this you for said a, a second. A, a random person? A, a, that lived in the mm -hmm. community. He was a member. He was a gang member. Okay. Yeah. Let me read, t read his report. Yes. And this came from a Sergeant Doty. And this is part of my receipts. And I'm not ashamed to say names and none of, the, none of that kind of stuff because my shit is real. So can't nobody come after, after me for no slander or anything like that. This is an official police report and they say who made it. So anyway, this gang member came up to Sergeant Doty. He was my sergeant. And so this was Sergeant Doty's uh, what he reported because he called me on the radio to tell me to come meet him so he could tell me about this shit. I had no idea what he was going to be telling me. So it says reporting sergeant while in the area of Hamilton Park, remember I talked about Hamilton Park, was approached by a citizen who inquired as to the whereabouts of P.O. P. Wanda. At this time, the citizen uh, went on to relate concern with the safety of this officer as he had related on several earlier occasions information regarding gang drug activity in the area. The citizen went on to say that there was a hit on Wanda and that the people that were going to do this hit knew where she lived. So now we done took this shit from just not helping me to now some motherfucking gave out my home address and, and part of, you know, a hit. Cause we learned later on that the officer, it was a police officer that gave out my address. And um, he was at, at the gang meeting while they was trying to organize all of this shit. And he was there. And he was part of the people that I had reported everything to. He was part of that corruption. Mm. Mm. So not only did he give out my address, he gave descriptions of my vehicle and all of that other kind of stuff. And so I'm like, damn. So I go, so my sergeant, tell me to go into the station. And so he going to pull me off the streets, you know, today or whatever, because I'm like freaking out. You know, this shit is real. And and um, that same after the officer, I'm sorry, after the sergeant called me to meet him where he could tell me what was going on. It was at the it was on 71st Street at William Hinton School. We was in that parking lot. And so um this person that reported it to him walked up at the same time while I was talking to Sergeant Doty. And so then he said what he told Sergeant Doty, he said it right there in front of me. And then he gave more information. He was like, you was over there on P Street. He said they was in the station wagon getting ready to cap your ass, but you was getting ready, you was talking to a senior citizen and they ain't want that kind of smoke with this. Mm. And, and and I ain't gonna lie, that shit scared yeah, me. Yeah. You know, it, it scared me. How so, old are you at this time? Um, in my, I'm I'm no more than 26, 27. A young lady. Like this young lady. And my condolences to her family. You know, that's why I say her story remind me. Her name was Ariana. Ariana, Ariana Preston. Preston. Yeah, her her story just remind me so much of my story. I mean, I was criminal justice degree going to law school, all of that kind of stuff. And then I had, I had properties, businesses. I modeled. I was a bodybuilder. I mean, I had a lot going on in my life and everything, just like she did to be cut down like that. But this, that could have happened to me. And it's just the grace of God that mm -hmm. it didn't. But anyway, so yeah, so um, the guy starts saying that they was going to cap you when you was on P Street. They was in that station wagon. And I saw the station wagon and he he was referring to and I'm like damn this is some real shit you know and so I went into the station and I called my husband I was married at that time to Jeffrey Wilson and I called him and told him what was going on and everything that I'd be coming home shortly or whatever now I'm from the streets my husband at that time was from the streets he um had his own businesses and all that kind of stuff and the only thing that he should have done different in his life was gotten a criminal expungement. He stole a radio and some car parts when he was young and never got that wiped off his record. And so 
as we go forward in this story, when he came to help me because he hadn't done his due diligence to you know, get his stuff together, they used that to their advantage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But anyway, so my husband was expecting me or whatever. And he, he was um, very familiar with the GDs and the BDs and all of that kind of stuff. So he went and did some digging and found out more about who was involved in all of this stuff. So, cause he wanted me to know. And so um, he gave, I found out who it was, who had given the information to the drug, to um, the drug dealers and stuff like that. And I made a police report. Yeah, I made an incident report and that's this right here. Okay. And it was in, and I reported that um, on April 8th, I called the police and told them that it was some suspicious vehicles uh, circling my house. And those was vehicles that I would see every day when I was doing my uh, foot patrol or walking or whatever. So I knew these vehicles wasn't from it. They weren't in my neighborhood. You know, they weren't people from my neighborhood. They was from where I worked in Inglewood. Mm -hmm. And so I called the police because remember, I'm a document queen. I'm a document the shit. I documented it. This was the official report that the officers that came uh, gave me. Now, they were reluctant in the beginning to give me this report, but I insisted. And they didn't know really what was going on or whatever, but they were just like, you know, what's the big deal or whatever. But no, this is my life you're talking about. So anyway, I got that that document uh, saying that these vehicles from my beat were uh, circling my house. And so I made after after that happened, the next day I'm coming to work. My expectation is if a person, if a citizen that came and told a sergeant that one of his officers has a hit, where she going, where she or he going to work the following day? Would, would you think that they going to put you right back out there? Mm -mm. That's what they did. They threw my ass right back out there in the trenches. They ain't had no love, no mercy, none of that shit for me. Mm -hmm. I'm out here every day breaking my ass, walking them fucking blocks and everything trying to do the right thing and then they sit up there knowing these motherfuckers talking about they gonna cap me and they put me right back out there on 732 right back out there on p street by my fucking self that shit pissed me off you know that's, that's just terrible so i began to complain every day they had me out there every day they had me out there now they got these these white bitches that just get out the academy and everything, they let them work inside the station be behind the comfort of the police desk. But they got my black ass out here on the streets hoofing it, and they know these motherfuckers gunning for me. I just, I couldn't accept it. So I made my report to, to the news media. I reported to the FBI. I reported it to um, the police union. I had all of this documentation because I'm like, this is wrong. Y'all not supposed to be doing that. I reported it up the chain of command. They were supposed to take me off the street. They weren't supposed to leave me out there. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, they left me out there, got me working and everything. Somebody called in the station every day asking where, I'm, where I am. Um, uh, is she coming in and all this kind of stuff? And they're giving out the information, just people calling, looking for me. How, how would you feel? Wouldn't you be like, what you know, this shit going to happen? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, so, and nobody helping me or anything like that. And so um, it went on like that, went on like that, including nobody responding to my calls. So my husband at the time, Jeff, Jeffrey Wilson, he... Um, on his uh, time off from work, because he worked for the railroad, he would come and back me up. Now, when have you ever heard some bullshit like that? Mm. The, the police officer husband got to come and back her up? And so um, he would just come and watch my back. Right. So he would come and watch my back, and then I began to just kind of like try to slow down, you know, not doing so much work or whatever, but it was weighing heavy on me. Every day, I didn't know if that was gonna be my last day. And, and they purposely, you know, like, fuck her, she don't matter, her life ain't shit. 
And, and the people that participated in it was the people that I went to college with, them old grimy ass, weak ass, fake ass niggas. You don't, you, when you a police officer, you don't really know the motherfuckers you working with until you get into the trenches and need some help. Cause them same motherfuckers that knew me all that time from college didn't open a fucking mouth to say nothing to help me. Plus they weren't even coming out there to back my fucking calls up. So I don't have no love. This some shit I've been wanting to get off my chest since 1995. I'm almost 60. I don't give a fuck no more. I don't care about hurting people's feelings and all of that shit. I don't care about that. And let's take a quick break on something. The motherfucker that report that, that put the hit out on me, he also went to internal affairs and said that I was a drug dealer because I was married to... Jeffrey Wilson. Jeffrey Wilson. Because they got him documented in the new type as, as a gangster disciple. Yeah, as a gangster disciple. But I, I don't really know what his ties were, but all I know is he was connected enough to find out what I needed to mm -hmm. know, who was involved in it and everything. He tried to see if he could get it squashed, but it came from the police department. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It didn't come straight from them or whatever. So anyway, um, this guy that did this, Okay, do you all remember a few years ago, it was a police officer, he was a warrant officer, and a woman came up into the police station to make a police report and he molested her in the station? I'm not familiar with the story. Here, it, it happened here okay. in Chicago. A Chicago police officer was a warrant officer. His name was Michael Clifton. He turned out to be a serial rapist, accused of being a serial rapist. Oh, you, you know the story I'm talking about? That story is connected to my story because that's the motherfucker that put the hit out mm. on me. We used to date. He didn't like Jeff, and that's how the shit started or whatever. But anyway, he is the one that did that. Now, all these women got raped. Did you notice how they just... This a black man we talking about? Yeah. Okay. They just swept that shit under the rug. He, he didn't go to jail or nothing like that. He was accused of attacking women, choking them out, raping them, and all this kind of stuff. I had made a police report against him for doing that to me. They just wiped my shit under the rug like it never happened. Anyway, if they had got rid of his ass when I reported that he was the one that did all of this stuff, then women wouldn't have been raped. So they left his ass on the police department 20-some years, and he turned out to be a serial rapist. That's some fucked up shit. Mm -hmm. That's some fucked up shit. And I got the receipt. So they can't come and tell, tell me that I'm slandering nobody name or anything like that. I got a, a thing right here. On June 15th, 1995, uh, I made a report that police officer Michael Clifton assigned to the 7th District is harassing police officer Wanda Wilson. And at that and that that officer is associated with a known drug dealer named JB. I made the report, told them. So people be trying to come at me like uh, my shit is fake and all that kind of stuff. I don't give a fuck because they ruin my reputation in the media, in the community and all that stuff. Calling me a drug dealer, uh, doing whatever they could to try to discredit me. And so I don't care anymore. My stuff is documented. All I'm doing is reading from an official police report. You tell me if that's slander. So I, I'm worried about all of that. But let me continue with the story because after this guy did what he had to do and my husband watching me and helping me and all that kind of stuff, one Sunday I pull up and I witness a drug transaction and it was in a van. It was a v involving a van. So I pulled it over because I'm still trying to work. I pull it over. I pull these three guys out. Now I got four guns on. It's, it's uh, cold outside, but I got my 357 on now. So anyway, I'm calling in the police radio for some backup. It's a Sunday morning, so you know ain't nobody busy. Mm -hmm. Nobody come. It's like 15, 20 minutes. I hear police in other districts. Ain't somebody gonna answer that 10-1 call from that lady? I, it's me against three. I got three dudes on a van, my gun on them. I ain't been able to search them or nothing, so I don't know what the fuck going on. And on top of all of that, it's a hit out on me. You get what I'm saying? 
So I don't know what the fuck is going on. After nobody came and, and, uh, and um, I could hear other officers wanting to respond, I, I just knew something was, they, they trying to kill me. This, this shit, you know, getting real serious. So anyway, I told them motherfuckers to get back in that van. I backed them up. I told them back away, get in that fucking van and leave. And then I backed up and got in my squad car. I cried so hard because that just was like the culmination of all of this corruption. And all I was trying to do was the right thing. Mm -hmm. All I was trying to do was my job. Mm -hmm. All I was trying to do was give back to the community. And this is the fucking payback that I get. And then like that morning that I pulled those three guys over, I'm in the roll call room. The people that's working squad cars like me, motherfuckers that I've been friends with for years, went to college with. I'm like, how the fuck you gonna let a fucking job sell you out from doing what's right? Them motherfuckers that I thought was my friends, they left my ass out there to get capped. So I don't have no love, no mercy on none of them. Chicago is like it is all fucked up like it is because when we was all out there supposed to be working, they wasn't doing their fucking job. Mm. I mean, that's the reality of it. Mm. You can't just have a handful of people doing a little bit here and a little bit there. We all was hired to, to work. And for them to just leave me high and dry like that, and I ain't hear from them. They ain't come to my police board thing. They weren't character witnesses or none of that shit. They just left me like that. And that just make you want to look at people that you calling your friends and associates. And especially um, when you in law enforcement, you don't know how the motherfuckers going to uh, turn on you. Somebody told me that they told them to shut the fuck up. Don't get involved in this if they didn't want to lose their jobs. <laughs> I'm like, whatever, whatever. That's all I can so, say. So this, this, was, this was the ultimate black ball. This was the ultimate black ball, which is leading up now to the climax. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I had made all of my police reports. Like I said, Russ Ewan, Walter Jacobson, uh, the police union, uh, the internal affairs, all these people. I made, I cover all in the FBI. I cover all of the bases, all of the bases. Um, and then, so the FBI contacted me and they wanted to meet with me at my home on May 19th, 1995. And so I took all of my receipts to work and made copies of them because they wanted to see what I had. So I'm thinking, okay, finally now I'm gonna get some fucking help. So I got an envelope full of every document, the originals that, and then I got the copies of all of this shit that went on for them that at least a year or whatever. I make the copies and then I get a call on the radio towards the end of my shift from the commander upstairs. Now remember, I'm trying to get inside, get off them streets, right? So the, the commander calls me in and say, we found you a spot you could start on Monday. Cause I think this was maybe a Friday or something. Mm -hmm. He said, you could start on Monday. Mm -hmm. and, and so I was like, cool, you know, I'm all excited. I, I'm so taken by what just happened because I've been fighting, fighting, fighting so hard to be able to get off the streets. I go downstairs to the locker room. I take off my bulletproof vest, put it in my locker. I ain't even thinking, cause usually I'm on high alert. I'm wearing my shit all the way to my crib. So I, so I take that off. I got all my guns and everything. So I'm straight on that. So I jump in my car and I'm heading down uh, Racine. Heading to, I lived in Beverly. So I'm heading towards my house or whatever. So when I get in my car, I'm in a 1995 Mercedes, and this is 1995. My car note was $795, but my jealous ass coworkers sitting up there thinking, you know, I'm balling or something like that because I got a brand new Benz. You can't, I like nice stuff, you know what I'm saying? You know, you like what you like. So anyway, I'm driving down the street in my Benz, and I look up in the rear view mirror, and I see this um, Bronco or Tahoe or whatever, it was a Chevy and it was um, following me. And I was like, damn, what the fuck is this? This is a Hispanic dude in here. 
And so that was odd because Inglewood is just blacks, mm -hmm. you know, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at, through my rear view mirror and I see this Hispanic dude following me and everything like that. And I didn't put it past that they could have brought, you know, other people in or whatever. So I was on alert. So what I did, I took off from the station at 61st and Racine. When I got down to 72nd and Racine, the guy was still behind me. I think it was 72nd or 73rd. So what I did was at that intersection, I moved all the way over to the left, got my left blinker on, and I said, I'm going to make a right from this left lane. And if this guy do it, then I know this motherfucker following me. Right. So, I, so when the light turned green from that left hand lane, I came all the way across and made my right turn and started going down the street. He did the same thing because he was behind me. He did the same thing. I'm like, oh, shit is on. So I floor it. I'm going all through the neighborhoods because I'm thinking this is the hit now. Because why would this guy be following me? You know what I'm saying? So I'm going all through the neighborhoods and everything like that, flooring it. And he's and still behind you. He's still behind me. And I was able to lose him at a light. So I had made my way up to 79th and Western. Back then, it used to be a restaurant called Miss Muffet right there on the corner. And so, and we didn't really have cell phones like we do now. So I didn't have access to a cell phone. I had to get out and use a pay phone. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I jumped out and I uh, called my husband, told him what was going on, gave him a description of this vehicle that was following me. He was like, uh, stay there, I'm gonna come. Um, he said, stay there, I'm gonna come to you. So anyway, I'm staying there. He, and so I said, well, uh, did you call the FBI? We supposed to be meeting them tonight. And so he was like, no, go ahead, call them. I'm going to try to call too. So I called the FBI from the restaurant and I got the guy's voicemail and I told him what was going on, uh, that I suspected somebody is following me right now. And my husband left him a message. We never got a chance to talk to him. So anyway, my husband finally makes it to Miss Muffet. I'm sitting there at a table just shaking. I'm in full uniform. I just don't have a vest on. But I'm in full uniform, like, oh, my shit, you know. So my husband come in. He was like, okay, come on. I'm going to follow you home. We get in the cars, and for some reason, this guy didn't notice, you know, what was going on. When we started driving, the guy was parked at 80th and Western. Remember, I'm coming from 79th. Mm -hmm. So he was parked in the bus stop. So I'm like... Damn, there he is. My husband about two cars behind. He didn't know my husband had came. So when I drove past 80, if the guy came right in and started trying to chase me again, my husband came from two or three car lengths back away and cut him off. This all in, it's five o'clock in the evening, rush hour traffic. My husband cut him off. They exchanged words. And then my husband's like, why the fuck you following my wife? Next thing you know, they start capping at each other. It's a full-blown shootout right there in the middle of the thing. Now, I done made it safely past Adia. I look in my rearview mirror, and I see my husband down on the ground shooting. And I could hear the shots, you know, as I was going. And that's why I was like, where, where is he? What's happening? So I bust a U, and I turn around, and I drive right back there to Adia where he is. So my husband... He started, like I said, he was shooting at the guy and the guy took off. And so I said, are you all right? Are you all right? He was like, yeah, get that motherfucker. So I followed the guy. I'm still a police officer. I get, this is a shooting. I'm catch this motherfucker, whatever. So I get into a shootout with him. We ended up doing a full circle and ended up back at 80th and Western. When we get to 80th and Western, people done started calling the police and all. You could hear sirens coming and stuff like that. So when the police initially arrived, I'm in full uniform, right? They, um, I tell them what's going on. This guy, uh, it's a threat against my life and this guy was following me and um, he got into a shootout with my husband and all this kind of stuff. So long story short, they put that guy in handcuffs and then they uh, assisted me, you know, trying to figure out all of this stuff. It wasn't 30 seconds later, Motherfucking internal affairs had now in the forest preserve up there on the 83rd. Damn, yeah. Mm -hmm. Come and say, 
Take them cuffs off that officer and lock that bitch up. Mm. Mm. Process that motherfucking shit for right. a minute. Say that again. Take them cuffs off that officer and lock that bitch up and get her piece of shit husband. I had to keep uh, bringing up race, but I'll be having to put race to face. Who, who is this saying? Is the white man or black man? No, a black man. Charles Williams. Sergeant Charles Williams. So you telling me like a lot of the, because I'm, we obviously listen to your story. A lot of your interactions with this BS was with other black officers. Yes. Wow. Yes. Plot twist. Yes. Okay. So tell me how the fuck they, okay. What they doing in there at the park district? They show up just like that. He identifies the officer as his officer. Mm -hmm. So this dude from internal affairs that I'm, that's chasing me. When all was said and done, they said that they were out there providing surveillance because they were trying to protect me. That's how they tried to clean it up. Right. How the fuck you going to try to protect somebody you know they know that it's been a threat against their life and you chasing them fucking down the street? But see, in the midst of all of that, they put their system in place. And I'm gonna tell y'all, I'm gonna educate y'all a little bit on their system. And part of their system is to discredit, manipulate, the media manipulates society so that nobody will believe a fucking word that you say. So let me tell you how they put the system against me. When I made my reports to the police department up the chain, they began, and when I say they, the corrupt motherfuckers began to make police reports against me, accuse me of being a drug dealer. So now they, they get to check into my life, you know, as much as they want to, which I didn't care because I wasn't no drug dealer. But they got that, they used that in the system to discredit me. So whenever I would go to anybody for help, they're saying, well, you know she's under investigation for being involved with gangs and her husband was a former gang member and all this kind of stuff. So they would just do everything they could to just try to discredit me. And that's, that's a tool, a system, a weapon that they use. As soon as anybody bring any kind of uh, complaint or allegation, that's one of the first things they're going to do. They're going to turn it around and make it like you the bad guy. Nobody should believe you. So they use that Officer Clifton to be able to say, oh, yeah, she, a, she, a, she uh, hanging around dope boys and all this kind of stuff. And that wasn't the case. They was just on some discredit stuff. But it just... It just wouldn't work. So anyway, we get into this shootout. Now I understand why the internal affairs is watching or is there or whatever, because they've been trying to discredit me. They even said that I made the whole thing up, that the guy that came and reported it to Sergeant Doty, they came and said that I told him to say that. Even Sergeant Doty, knowing what the truth was, he came down there and lied. Black guy. So they saying that I made a, first they called me a dope dealer, then they said I made a false police report, that I lied about a hit being on me, that I made the whole thing up. That's what they did. They said that I made the whole thing up. Mm. And so they got all of that documented and everything like that. But the problem is they didn't know at the time that I was documenting everything that I was doing, every person I was reporting it to. So long story short, after me and this officer get into a shootout, the police come, they lock me up. Um, we drive into the police station. They've taken me to 51st and Racine. They take my husband there and um, they separated us and then um, Detective Mosley, black person, kept coming in there, you know, trying to get me to give some kind of statement or whatever. But 
You don't say shit. You know what I'm saying? You keep your fucking mouth shut because you know that they're going to take whatever you say and turn it around. That's street code. Am I right? You don't say shit. If they got a case against you, let them motherfuckers prove it. You don't incriminate yourself. You got a right against self-incrimination. My husband from the streets, he thinking he helping the situation. He was like, they was trying to kill my wife. It was a hit out against her. I just came to help her, whatever. He placed himself at the scene. He did all of that. He hung his own self because he gave a statement and they took his statement and turned it around. Mm. Got him for attempted murder, mm. impersonating the police officer, all of that shit. I'm just telling you. He did four. He did four years for that shit. They tried to make me testify against him. And remember, I always say I wanted to be a lawyer, right? I've always been real legal smart. So the attorney that I hired for my husband was trying to force me to testify on behalf of my husband. I knew that if I had gotten fired from the police department, I would, re, would um, lose all of my impunity, all of my coverage of, of them um, uh, keeping me under the umbrella of a police officer. Mm-hmm. So then I would be subject to criminal charges mm-hmm. and everything like that, mm-hmm. in, indemnification. So that's what it's called. They, they would still indem, in, indemnify me if I was still a police officer because I'm doing my job. But if I wasn't a police officer, had gotten fired, then I would be open for whatever the fuck they want to do. Okay. So anyway, I knew that. And so I refused to give testimony. So they brought up a charge of um, contempt of court against me. Okay. So the morning that I had to go to court, I just knew that the type of person I am, if I get in front of the right audience and I can speak on my behalf, that I would get out of it because the truth going to prevail. So anyway, I take my daughter. She was a baby at the time. I take her and drop her off at um, daycare. I ain't make no phone calls to make no arrangements or nothing. I'm going to court and I could possibly be going to jail. But I just wasn't thinking like that. I'm like, the truth going to come out. So anyway, we in the courtroom. The judge, the judge is hearing everything. And my lawyer uh, and my husband's lawyer were both like, no, she should be able to go ahead and testify. But the law say that a, a wife or a husband is not compelled to get testimony against their spouse or whatever. Because in the Bible, it say the two are one flesh. That's where that kind of comes from. Yeah. So you don't have to testify against yourself. Yeah. So anyway, I refused. And I raised my hand and I asked the judge, could I speak on my behalf? Because I see that my lawyer ain't helping me and the ones I'm paying for, Jeff, they ain't helping him. You know, they, they ain't helping. They're not looking at the bigger picture. Somebody got to be around for our daughter. So anyway, I asked the judge, could I speak? I quoted that area of the Constitution, that area of the law. And I told the judge, I'm not compelled to give testimony. And if I do, I, I would be waiving a right of protection that I have for myself. And so the judge said, she absolutely correct. He said, uh, that, that's dismissed. And people that was in, uh, we was at 26 in California, the people that was in the courtroom just started because the judge began to just, you know, tell how, how I was correct. And everybody that was in the courtroom, they was waiting for their cases, but they was in the courtroom hearing about our case because this was about the big shootout on 80th and Western. So if you in there and it's your case, you're like, ooh, you know, damn. Yeah. So they was all really into what, the case was about. And then when I was able to get that uh, small victory, the people was just cheering, standing up and everything. And I was like, wow, you know, I'm just going off of faith, believing that I'm going to be all right. But yeah, I I walked out of there that day. And so um, I was good with that. Now back to the system. I said they tried to discredit you, right? The next thing they did, they tried three times to get grand jury indictments against me. And they couldn't get a true bill on none of those tries. Mm. That's when they go in and they have a, a it, it's like you can't be there. Your lawyers and nobody's there. It's like a secret kind of meeting or whatever with a jury. And they present evidence and the people 
uh, come back with a true bill and it'll say whether or not it's enough information to actually charge the person. They tried three times to charge me and they couldn't do it. No. They then tried to get a search warrant on my house. They couldn't get the judge to sign a search warrant because I knew if they was getting a search warrant, they was going to come up in there and try to plant some drugs or whatever. Because remember, they trying to find anything to discredit me. So then the next thing that they did was um, they began to, to after the shootout, I was placed on punishment, like working at uh, 11th and State, the nine emergency calls or whatever. And so on my way home from work, Jeffrey would come and pick me up. And they would follow us and try to provoke another incident, mm -hmm. another incident. And we just, I, I would have to beg him because he was high head, Jeff. And I'm like, don't play into it. This is all part of their system. You know, they're doing this shit on purpose. And so I, I can actually say that I am a survivor. No, I am a victor over their system because they tried everything they could. Mm. But the one hero that I do want to point out in this situation is, remember I told you that I had all of my receipts, mm -hmm. all of my receipts with me? When they put me in custody, I'm sitting there with this big ass manila envelope and I'm holding it like this. And it got all of my stuff in it. And I know that if one of them motherfuckers come and get this, it's over. I don't have a leg to stand on. For some reason, they never noticed it. So I'm in custody for like five, six hours or whatever. Now they were supposed to give me a phone call. They didn't. They let the other officer call the union because whenever a, there's an officer involved shoot, shooting, the union comes out. So they let him call for union representation, but they didn't let me call. So I'm like, damn. But when a union rep came, he learned that it was a police officer another police officer involved. So he said he wanted to see me. He come in there. And um, now remember, I had already reported my stuff to the police union. And so when he came in there and we got to talk and he was like, didn't you make a report about this? And I was like, yeah. And so he knew behind the scenes what was really going on. So every time in your life, it might be one time when you just got to trust somebody. And this was my hero. His name was Harold Coombs. And um, I asked him, I told him, I said, if you would please just take this envelope and go off to the side somewhere and read, read some of it, it will tell you exactly what is going on. I said, I got to trust somebody. I said, I'm going to give these, these papers to you. He was like, I'll hold them for you. I'll hold them for you. He was like, you can come and get them tomorrow, you know. And so he went out of the room and he went off and I'm assuming that he read it because I can't see him. You know, I'm in a room or whatever. All I know is this big commotion start. He come back. He was like, you motherfuckers know y'all wrong for this shit. Y'all need to release her. How the fuck y'all going to do this to this officer? That was the union guy. He, he had my back. Yeah, white guy. See? Ain't that After I was released from custody, I went to the Fraternal Order Police Headquarters to meet with him because the union, they like, no, nah, we're going to help you. Wow. They wasn't going for all of this corrupt shit. They was like, no, we're going to do whatever we can to help you. They gave me a lawyer and all of that kind of stuff. So anyway, while we in there, um, somebody called and said that the detectives are trying to are on their way they're getting ready to try to lock her up. And he was like, for what? He said they got an arrest warrant saying that she threatened one of them. I'm just going to use my words. That she threatened the white girl at the police desk that get to work inside in the comfort and safety. They saying she threatened her mm. by saying, you lucky you get to work inside. Mm. They took them words as a threat. As a threat. <laughs> this man was my hero. He told the receptions, go downstairs, lock the doors. He locked off the building and wouldn't let the detectives come in there and arrest me. Mm. And shout out to Harold. Come on. I really appreciated mm -hmm. that. But yeah, Somebody had your back. Somebody that had my God. back. Yep. 
But that you see, God. but you see the pattern. Mm -hmm. They try, try everything yeah, that yeah. they could. The devil is a lie. Yep. And who was it? The black goonies that sell themselves out, come and trying to arrest me for some shit that was nothing but an argument. Yeah, I cussed the bitch out. I'm pissed off. You got me going back out there on the streets and this bitch get to work in, at the front desk answering the phones, but I'm out there hoofing it, risking my life. Hell yeah, I'm upset about that. I ain't give a fuck about that bitch. Rightfully so. Yeah, I ain't give a fuck about her. Cecilia Bohan. <laughs> fuck her. Just saying. I don't care. They gonna let that bitch work inside and keep, me, keep my black ass outside. It just was wrong. It just was wrong. But I do thank uh, Harold Coombs for what he did to help me because he didn't have to do that. He could have been just like everybody else. He could have been like all of them. All they did was turn their head and allow the situation to progress where I could have got killed. Then had the audacity to say I made it up. Then had the audacity to say that they was out there not trying to kill me, but trying to protect me. That's in my receipts. Who would believe that? They'd be saying anything. That's what I say. He, he who controls the narrative. And they had all of the control. They were manipulating the media and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's all right. And so for the people that's watching, that's why it's important not to believe everything you see on the Thank news. Thank you. Everything do not be true. Yep. We talked about that. Well, we had that conversation with Charleston White. That's what I was telling Charleston oh, White. Oh, yeah, that's another one. I like him. You like him? Yeah, I like Charleston, but he, <clears throat> he get a little yeah. you know, rough around the edges. Did, you, did but you watch our interview with him? Did I do? I saw your interview with him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we was talking about that, you know, yeah. how, you know, the media can portray a whole different, you know, reality. Yeah. And I have to challenge that is because, you know, uh, with me being in the media field and you being in the media field yourself, you know, a lot of shit in the headlines be fake, right? Charles and White shoots himself in the leg in the club. We know that's fake. Uh, you, you, you miss Charles what I, and White, you, 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 Soldier uh, Boy. Uh, you, you miss what I'm saying. That's not the media field. I'm not in the media field. I don't have a media press pass. I'm a YouTuber with content. YouTubers aren't the media field. I get no information from YouTube. I get no information from Google. I'm going to go to a library database that's going to give me access to police records, mm -hmm. news articles, because if the news reports something wrong, they can be you sued. You know the news is fake. L listen to me. If the news reports something wrong, they can be sued. That's why they have a correction section. Where if they say something wrong, they say, hey, we got to correct this because they can be sued. YouTubers can't be sued for saying something wrong. YouTube don't have a media press pass where if the president now, comes... Hold on, now, 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 let's talk. I don't mean to cut you off, but I do want to talk about fake news just right now because you're a Donald Trump supporter, correct? Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a conservative voter. Uh, who just so happened to vote for Donald Trump because he pushed the conservative platform. But and no. you know, he also pushed the fake news agenda with Fox, correct? Uh, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know that to be true. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 and I come to challenge you today because I, I, I watch a lot of your well, interviews. Well, you, you, you know you, what I'm saying? You, listen, you, you missing what and I'm you, saying. No, I ain't missing. I'm, listen, I'm hold, right on, here, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. If you hear I me I want out, you to be right here where but, I'm at too, though. But, but I'm way past you, brother, because you stuck on the news. I'm telling you, I done went to the but library. But you talking about credible sources. But, but listen to me. You, you said saying, news articles. But, but that's but where listen, I'm at. Listen, listen, listen. You saying news, news, and news articles are totally different. You got different, the articles bro. from the news. No, you sir, ain't talking to no fool. What's the, up, Mr. Charles? Uh, let, let me explain something to you, brother. You don't see news editors on television. The people who write the news aren't newscasters. You totally confused. The newscasters reporting what they got from the news uh, editors. That, that's, that's not true at all, brother. What you mean uh, that's not true? The, the, the things that's reported on the news are not equally to the things that's written in papers. That's why you got Bill O'Reilly who goes on television and speak, and you got Bob Ray Sanders who write and you'll never see his face. They don't say the same things. Because one is pushing a narrative. One has to really write. That's why all news journalists who write have to have a source. That's why when the government say, hey, give me your source. Hey, man, my freedom of press. I don't have to tell you who told me this information. The news guy on television, he can tell you whatever because those are two different entities. 
And that's what we need to know as black people in America. The guy that's on the television, he's full of shit. The guy that's writing, that's why they're trying to take the writers out. So if you ever want to hide something from a nigga, put, put it, it in the book. Like I say, they, they, they had everybody convinced that I was a drug dealer. I'm like, well, I got to deal drugs or whatever. I'm just a, I'm just a, a woman that's street smart from the streets that knew how to hustle and get her game on. I've been on welfare. I saved my, before I even became a police officer, I bought my first building when I was 20. I saved my welfare checks to come up with a $500 deposit, ran into some shysty realtors that um, sold me a, 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 a building, an apartment building. Because my mother had the cleaners, I was able to show that I had a job. That was just me being street smart. Mm -hmm. So I had money when I was on the police department. I had multiple streams of income. That was something that they couldn't even fathom. Mm -hmm. But I always had multiple streams of income. Mm -hmm. that's, how I, that's how I move. I find things that I know I'm good at, and I do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Make some money with it. Make some money with it. And I, I make sure that I solve hard problems. At least one of my businesses is going to be found in a hard problem that I know how to solve naturally. And I'm gonna make my my paper off that. That's gonna be my bag. Mm. Yeah. You smart. Thank you. Mama ain't raised no fool. She ain't raised no fool. Sure. And you ain't raising no fool. I know that. Shout out to your daughter. Yeah. Like I say, I didn't have any idea she was reaching out to you, but I thought I think she saw this mm -hmm. and it prompted mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Cause she had no idea. After she called you, they didn't even know the story. I told it to my daughter and Snow. I told it to them, and um, they were just like you guys. Yeah. Then they were like, no, you got to go over there. You got to get this out. You can't just be sitting in a box. Mm -hmm. It was sitting in a box in the garage. Mm -hmm. all, my, all my receipts. Wow. Yeah. That's what's up. Yeah. But I just hope that somebody is encouraged by uh, my story. Somebody is inspired by it. And I just hope that somebody that may be facing situations like this that's in law enforcement, feel like they can, you know, make some good decisions to get away from, from them kind of environments, even if you got to change departments or whatever. You don't have to choose to be corrupt. You have a choice. You don't have to do it. You know? And that would be my contribution if I ever came back and was working with the Chicago Police Department. I would want to teach ethics in law enforcement. And people might be like, who the fuck is she the teacher? Yeah, motherfucker, I said it. I would like to teach ethics in law enforcement because you have to bring in the ethical side of the officer. That side can't be dormant. You, you have a right to be ethical. They, on paper, want you to be like that, but in practice, they don't. No, I'm going to be one way. You ain't going to have me fucking over people and all that kind of stuff just on some bullshit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you were on the force for nine years total? Pretty much, yes. From 1986 to 1995? Yes. And you started to notice corruption toward the end of your uh, stay, or was it throughout the whole time that you were noticing things? It was probably towards the end, like the last two years. Okay. Yeah, the last two years. The reason why I ask is because um, when I was doing my research, I was looking at who was the superintendent during those times. Mm -hmm. um, so we know about Fred Rice. That was the superintendent when you first joined the, the force, Fred Rice Jr. Yeah. And then it was Leroy, Leroy Martin, Martin. Yeah. both African-American brothers. Yes. And then, um, you know, by 1995, it was Matt Rodriguez. Yeah. So was there any type of um, change in the system when Rodriguez became the superintendent? No, not that, not that I can really recall. I think um, to really give you a good answer to your question about the corruption, it was pretty much always there because when I was a police officer, I remember other police officers getting in trouble for uh, selling drugs and different things like that under all of those administrations. So it wasn't just Matt Rodriguez. Right. But um, I remember being young on the force that I would hear about officers that I knew that had gotten indicted and different things like that for being involved in street gangs and narcotics, things like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you also mentioned uh, uh, Officer 
Michael Clifton. Yes. That's the officer who put the hit out on you. Yes. Um, and we did our research on him. Who he, he was just released not too long ago on a sexual abuse charge. Yes. Um, he ran out to jail with his jacket covering his head. Yeah, he running from the see, press. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the cameras. Um, this is a guy you also said you used to date. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, can you tell us when you first met Michael Clifton? Um, when I I got assigned to the Ingl Inglewood District right after the academy. And so I met him probably in June or July of 1987. Okay. And he was already working there. He had come out of the police academy earlier in a different class or something like that. Okay. And we were all just friends. And um, one day I was in a car accident uh, going on a uh, man with a gun call. And I uh, was struck by a vehicle in an intersection and I broke my left leg. And so I had to work inside the police station after I was able to return to work. And then that's when I would have more contact with him because I was working inside, giving out the police radios. And we just became friends from that point. Okay. Yeah. And so is it a, uh, like, is it a rule within the um, Chicago Police Department like about dating uh other officers no okay and we was all wilding out you know okay. with no church saint girl right kind of situation everybody was just doing all kinds of stuff okay cool yeah yeah because i'm just really tr just trying to paint the picture of you know what was going on at the yeah. time right yeah um because you said you was dating michael clifton um so if you all were dating how did it get to the point where uh sexual assault is is, is the topic well, let me see how to answer that. Okay, first, first, me as a person, I dated, I was young. I think y'all seen some of the pictures where I looked like when I was, you, you know. You looking good. Yeah. You still look good. Yeah, so anyway, we were wilding out. So I dated him. I had a lot of boyfriends okay. or whatever, because I was the shit, you know. Okay. So anyway, he and I didn't date a long time. We just dated briefly or mm -hmm. whatever. And during that, um, brief period that we dated, it was toxic. Okay. And so I just couldn't deal with it anymore like that. And so uh, he was just real petty. You know how sometimes you break up with people and then they just can't handle the breakup or whatever. So he couldn't handle that, you know, seeing me with other people and all that kind of stuff. And so he physically assaulted me um, during the course of our breakup or whatever. And I reported it to the police department that he choked me out. Um, and the police didn't really do anything. They didn't take my complaint serious. And this was years before all of this hit stuff. They just didn't take it serious or whatever. And so, um, you know, that, that was where it all started with him, my problems with him. That was where it all started. Like when we broke up, he was the type of man that just kept a grudge the whole time. Because yeah. at this point, y'all still working together, right? Y yeah, we still working, working you know. at the same right. police department or whatever, seeing each other every day or whatever. But we weren't talking or anything like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and 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 when we when we when we when we listen to your story, you know, you got you got you got multiple different characters. Mm -hmm. Um. If I'm watching this story, if I'm watching this movie, because you painted a movie for us, okay. right? Okay, yes. Um, <clears throat> I'm very interested in this guy, Jeffrey. Okay. I'm very interested in Jeffrey, right? Uh-huh. Um, Jeffrey seemed like he was the real nigga in the situation. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so based off what you shared with us, what I learned about Jeffrey is... Uh, Jeffrey was riding for his woman, first and foremost. Yeah, he was my ride or die, yeah. no, no doubt with that. And I have a lot of respect for him mm -hmm. because a lot of men wouldn't have been able to get involved in that, you mm -hmm. know. But um, he just wasn't afraid of it. He just right. a, he a real nigga. He, yeah. he ain't afraid of that. Yeah. yeah. So how do you all go from ride or die to, you know, not being together anymore? Well, he blamed me for him being charged with all of this. I never, when I when I called him to tell him that I was being followed, I didn't say, come out here, help me grab my gun, none of that kind of stuff. 
he made his own decision on how he wanted to get involved in all of this okay. stuff. And so in the end, I just feel like his mistakes were that he gave statements which were turned against him and his actions in terms of getting involved in it. He made those decisions, even though it probably saved my life. Right. But I can't I can't take responsibility for his decisions. So all that time, he just blamed me, blamed me, blamed me. And we just couldn't get past that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that was the end of that. Even mm -hmm. even today, he's still, you know, kind of like blaming me, hating me. You ruined my life, blah, blah, blah. So he's very bitter. Yeah, he's bitter yeah. about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So when he's blaming you, though, like he's blaming you for or what, what was his expectations for you is what I'm asking. What he, was he? He open? thought that. He was going to get off because he was telling the truth. If he didn't have a record, if he wasn't a convicted felon, mm -hmm. they wouldn't have been able to do, deal with him like that. Like in the beginning, people was like, oh, man, y'all getting ready to get paid. You know, you, these people trying to kill you and, and they uh, got, you got into a shootout with them and all that kind of stuff. And everybody was looking at it from the surface like, oh, man, y'all getting ready to get a fat check. You know, all this kind of stuff. But he... Because he didn't get an expungement when he was young, which had nothing to do with me, he allowed a situation from his past to be utilized to take him down a path uh, of um, persecution with the police department because he had a bad record. Mm -hmm. And if he had gotten those little things cleaned up on his own, which didn't have anything to do with me, then he would have been fine. Yeah. Yeah. So with like with all that you've with all that you've been through, um do do you do you sometimes feel like or, or what's what what is your thoughts on, you know, that relationship? Even though it's over, you know, if you just look back on it, were there any things you feel like you probably could have done differently? Yeah, I think I think that in the beginning, um I could have probably talked to to Jeff more about his past or whatever, and maybe even helped him with, you know, getting his paperwork filed, you know, about his background and stuff like that, the expungement. Right. But when you dating somebody and, you know, you, you kicking it with them, you, you know, you, you don't really talk about stuff like, stuff that. like that. You right. know, people don't want to talk about it, things like that. I think out of this whole situation that happened to me, Talking about these two men, Michael Clifton and Jeffrey Wilson, is probably the most difficult and uncomfortable part of all of this because I'm opening myself up to vulnerabilities with having to deal with the conversations that may come from mm -hmm. this. But they are part of the story, too. Right. You right. know, and so that's that's where I just got to be like, fuck it. I got to tell it. Yeah. You know, I'm not lying. Yeah. Yeah, it just need to be told. And this is my story. Yeah. But they happen to be some characters in yeah, my right, story. Right. But nevertheless, it needs to be addressed. Yes. But yeah, this is probably the most uncomfortable part of, of this whole thing because mm -hmm. it's easy to be able to be in conversations with them. These other motherfuckers that's on the police department, I can give two shits about yeah. them. One yeah. of them called me on some bullshit. It's our own. Yeah. But this is more personal and mm -hmm. close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. because I had a relationship with Michael Clifton, had a relationship with Jeffrey Wilson. Right. They both knew each other. Right. So um, we all knew each other. Yeah. Yeah. So, but like I said, it's uncomfortable yeah. or whatever. Um, yeah. And I, I, it's, like I said, when, you know, we just, we just, we all got it in our head. We're just looking at it, right? Uh, and, um, I was just when I was reviewing everything, um, I was just feeling like, man, you know, it was, it, it was like you against the world. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and he had your back, you know, was, you know, kind of like a Bonnie and Clyde, you know, yeah. type of situation. You know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, those type of persons, they're rare. You know, you don't yeah. find too many of them. Yeah. You know? I, I would. I, I put him on a pedestal as far as his character mm -hmm. and his street cred or whatever. He the realest nigga I never met in my life, you know, even though it didn't work out with us and everything like that. Yeah. I still have mucho respect for him. Yeah, for I sure. mean, because a lot of guys wouldn't even, you know, stood up, mm -hmm. you know, because he was he, even before it led to the 
or shootout or whatever, he was coming watching my back while I was doing patrol, right, basic right. patrol yeah, activities like and everything like that. He could have been, he should have been at home sleep, but he had my back. So, mm -hmm. you know, I yeah. mean, I, I can't take that away. That credit away from him. Mm -hmm. He real street nigga. He just don't play and everything like that. Mm -hmm. But um, I just wish that it had not turned out like that because we had a good chemistry together and stuff like that. Yeah. But um, it was just too much with the police department. Like they would after the shootout, they would um, when I say they internal affairs would we'll just try to set up little scenarios where there would be a, a second confrontation and things like that. And I was trying to school him on that. You know, don't let them provoke you to, because they knew that he was one of them niggas. If he had a gap, he going to pull it out on you, fuck it, and ask the questions later on or whatever. He, he wasn't hesitant in popping off on the police. And so they knew that, and they would try to provoke more confrontations. And I kept begging him, Stop getting emotional in all of this stuff. You know, don't do that. And that was difficult because he just, it was against his wiring, I guess. Mm -hmm. He was just like, you fuck with me, I'm going to fuck you up. Mm -hmm. you, that's how he is. Mm -hmm. And so um, in the end, I think, though, his anger towards me is because I didn't go to prison. Okay. But like I say, I document everything. He wouldn't have gone to prison if he had taking care of his business back in the past and then we would have got a, we would have got paid yeah. but they was able to use that to discredit me because he was convicted felon over a radio or car part or something he had stolen when he was 17 now mind you we in our 20s almost 30 when all this other stuff happened yeah. but you can leave stuff in your past and let it linger and it can come back up to haunt you and that's pretty much what happened with this his criminal record from when he was like 17, 18, was what they used to take him down and get him involved, get him uh, convicted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, recently here in Chicago, actually this past Sunday, which was Mother's Day. Okay. Uh, it, her name was Alicia Carter. She was 33 years old, Chicago police officer. Okay. She was found dead in her home. Mm -hmm. um, when you watch the news clipping, the reporter is going to say the cause of death has not been determined. Okay. Um, this didn't get as much attention as Ariana Preston. Okay. You know, so it kind of going to the conversation we was having about the media, right? Yes. Uh, but it seemed like th this is this a, a, a reoccurrence going on right now. Chicago police female officers. Um, I, I cause of death undetermined. I sure hope not that we are seeing some kind of pattern, you know, of attacks against uh, female police officers. I hope that that is not the case because that would absolutely be, you know, devastating and it's just terrible. Um, I think like I, I hadn't heard about this second one that you're talking about. I just pray that it's, you know, that the truth comes out, yeah. that the truth comes out just like with um, the young lady, Preston is the last name. Yeah. Yeah. Officer Preston. I just pray that the truth comes out in her particular case. Um, I, I see enough that it would make me question anything that I read in the newspapers. Cause remember whoever has the information controls the narrative. And so the narrative can be directed for whatever purpose the director wants the narrative to go. Exactly. You got to always remember that. Yeah. And so, you know, some of these situations, we may never know what's really going on behind the scenes. Yeah. yeah. But I, I guess if I had to speak to a woman in law enforcement here in Chicago, you know, in this environment that we have, in this culture that we have, I would just say, you know, just be careful and use your guts, use your wits, use common sense. And don't let your guards down. You have a tough job to do. And, um, you know, we appreciate your service and everything. But at the end of the day, we want to see you go home to your family. Mm -hmm. You know, and so mm -hmm. that that's the most important thing. These people are being, these young women are being taken from their families. That's tragic. Yeah. Yeah. I was almost taken from my family. That would have been tragic. Yeah. So I know, I know 
what it's like to work for the police department under the threat of losing your life, you, you know, from a gang hit or something like that. I know what that's like. It's a terrible feeling. When we talk about corruption, um, that 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 uh, brings forth like a political conversation, right? Mm -hmm. It could, um, yeah. How far, how high up does the corruption go? How how high have you seen? Because I know you said you used to report. Yes. To the superiors, right? Yes. How high did you make it up the chains? I guess what I'm trying to ask. In my honest opinion, based on the little window of time that we're talking about, about my scenario, not about anything that's going on now, because I, I've been out of the pictures uh, over 20 some years, 26, 27 years. So mm -hmm. what I'm getting ready to speak about, my opinion is about the culture at the time when right. I was an officer. That, and that's what I'm asking. I about. felt that it had gone up as high as internal affairs. Okay. And um, it probably could have gone up even higher than that. But I just feel like internal affairs was the, the, the main part of it. And these people, and, and why I, I believe that that was important now in retrospect, because if you're reported to do something, if, it, if someone makes a report of corruption against you, the internal affairs is the people that's going to investigate it. Right. The people that were involved in my situation had multiple complaints against them about corruption and different things like that that were supposed to be investigated and adjudicated by the internal affairs, and they didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And so it was clear that they were involved in it to some degree. Mm -hmm. And like I had mentioned um, also, I don't think that it was appropriate for, if I get into a shootout with internal affairs, for that same unit, those same officers, to investigate the shooting. That's definitely biased. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened in my particular case. They handled the whole thing. They even had the guy that I got into the physical shootout with. They had him doing investigative work for a case where he was the complainant. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. it, was, it was like no separation. So whatever, they had the information, they controlled the narrative. That's why I got fired. Yeah. What is it about your story? Because I heard you say, you know, I've been waiting 28 years to get this off my chest, right? Yeah. Um, can you tell us what's been bothering you for 28 years? The fact that I was never cleared in public. Okay. I never received an apology from the police department for trashing my um, name, my reputation, for all of the things that they did to me. Um, one of the most insulting things that happened to me in all of this was um, on 80th and Western, when we were um, right after the shootout and the IAD and all the people came and they switched it around because at first they had the, the person that I had the shootout with, which I didn't know was an officer at the time. They had him in custody and then they came and they switched it all around and they put me in custody. Um, at that time, this big fat sergeant, his name was Bukowski, um, he comes over to me while I'm out there on the street and rips my police badge off. Bitch, you don't deserve to wear that. And that, I, I never forget that. I, I know it may sound strange. I remember every name of every motherfucker involved in my situation. Mm -hmm. I, I remember their faces. I remember their names. I remember what they did. I remember the lies that they told. So he rips my badge off. They come and they tow my cars, dragging them down the street. It was like we were, you know how they say you're innocent until proven guilty? We were proven guilty right there on the scene by the entire police department. And that bothered me all those years. They, they never gave me a chance, a fair chance, a fighting chance to show my receipts. And the people knew, you know, that this was some bullshit. And so for the 26, 20, yeah, 26 years, I had to deal with that. 
when, when this stuff first happened, every new relationship that I would have, meet a new friend, a new job or whatever, I always felt like I had to prove my innocence to people because mm -hmm. some kind of way they would find out because my stuff is still on the Internet. Mm -hmm. And people would find out and they'd be like, oh, you was that officer? Mm. And so and then I'm trying to always no, I, it's not what you think and all that kind of stuff. And I don't think that that's my place to have to clear my name. The police department owes me an apology and a bag. Mm -hmm. I lost my pension. I, I lost my house. I lost a ton of money out of all of this stuff. All because I chose to do the right thing that was right in my sight. Mm -hmm. And they never, they, they just swept me up under the rug, you know, like, like I never existed. And then one of the most insulting things that I have in my receipt, uh, Sergeant Stephen Jackson, well, his daughter worked with, with me um, in patrol in the Inglewood district, but this was her father that was the detective from Internal Affairs that was processing the case, one of us. He used to refer to me as bitch, bitch, you lying. He would just be so rude and everything. And so this particular sergeant, he writes in the report, when he asked me during the interview, why would anybody want to kill you? Mm. Yeah. Why would anybody want to put a hit out on you? It, to me, he devalued me, and, and I just never forget it. I just feel like they owe me an apology for what they did to me. Mm -hmm. And during, during this time that it first happened, you know, you get depressed and different mm -hmm. things like mm -hmm. that. And so the police union had um, given me a number to a psychologist to talk to, because this was a lot of stuff. I'm involved in a shootout now. I'm accused and all that kind of stuff. And so I called the um, psychologist that I was referred to to set up the appointment. And so he, he took my call, and this was his response. Oh, yeah, so you that crooked cop that got in that shootout on 79th. Mm. This is what the professional psychologist that's supposed to talk to me about my mental issues, I've been in a shootout. I need some professional help. He said, oh, you that crooked cop. Right. You that crooked cop. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So I couldn't get, it was like I couldn't get no love from nobody. Right. I would even go to churches, try to talk to pastors and stuff. Everybody judged me off of what they read. They never gave me the benefit of the doubt. Never gave me the benefit of the doubt. And, you know, back then we didn't have the internet and social no, media and stuff like that. that. But I'm assuming that. like, so th this story was viral. Yes. Back then. Yeah, it was on, it was on Eyewitness News. We had Russ Ewan was like one of the good, you know, famous reporters or whatever. It was on um, all of the major networks. It was the the it, it was the leading story for the six o'clock news because it had happened at five about 5 p.m something like that and it was the leading story that night and so it was like i said it was all over the news they, they had like your 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 pitch on it they never published my picture okay. they never did that but they published jeff's picture right, right. yeah they had his information right. yeah but it, it was terrible they yeah. they trashed my reputation my neighbors I had bought a house in Beverly, and my neighbors, uh, would, their kids would tell my niece and, and my son and that, uh, oh, your mom is, uh, your mom is, is a crooked cop, you know, diff different things like that. And it's all because of the information that they put out in the media. Right, right. Yeah. And then the audacity of the police department to try to say that that incident where this vehicle is following me uh, uh, and I make the uh, uh, illegal turn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're trying to say that at that particular time, the person that was behind me that did the, that mimicked my illegal traffic uh, maneuver was doing that for the purpose of surveillance. That you would have to be the dumbest person in the world to believe that. <laughs> And mm -hmm. and it's written it's written in the report that that his 
reasoning for committing that same maneuver was for surveillance purposes. And surveillance on who? Me. Mm. The purpose of surveillance is that you're supposed to be observed without knowing that you're being observed. Okay. So how could you call that surveillance? That mimic behavior for a hit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. But the reports that the Internal Affairs wrote up say that I should have assumed that that was for my protection. Right. That's so ludicrous. Makes absolutely no sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had an interview with Chairman Fred Hampton Jr. And, um, you know, his story in relation to his father being assassinated by the FBI. Wow. You know, he say uh, Chicago Police Department is like the biggest gang in the world. Good question I got for you, right? One question I'm very interested in. What are your views on a young black man that's looking to join the Chicago Police Department? I'm, you know, I uh, it was, it was, it was, uh, people just say no to gangs, you know. They, <laughs> <laughs> so that's the biggest I'm, gang in the world, I'm, ain't it? I don't sound cliche, but you know, I, you know, I, 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 I want to encourage people, you know, that type of gang activity. I, you know, that's, that's man, you know, I mean, you looking at life, you know, you get engaged in a lot of drive-bys and all type of shit, man, you know. That's, that's, yeah, that's some hell of, yeah, that's some hell of action there, man, it's, yeah. He ain't lying. He ain't lying. It's just, it's terrible. And I, 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 I'm holding out for hope that Chicago can change and be the beautiful city and environment that it once was, but it's going to take a lot of work and effort to clean up all this damn corruption. Mm. And even like, People are, people on the internet are making, um, they're, they're making some good commentary about this young lady, this young officer that was slain. And, um, you know, at some point we can't always just swallow what the media say. Because if you Google out there about me, you're going to see, it's going to say cop versus cop versus fake cop. You're going to see that article. Mm -hmm. You're going to see where they said that I was a gang member. Mm -hmm. You're going to see where they said I was a drug dealer. You're going to see all of that. And and I talked to the media myself and told them, and they seen my receipts. Mm -hmm. And them motherfuckers still printed whatever mm -hmm. they wanted to. Mm -hmm. Then finally, after it all you know, came down to the end, I think they pr printed a little blurb you know, saying that it wasn't what we thought it was yeah so when you when you see a situation like this with ariana preston um 24 years old chicago police officer she was gunned down right in front of her home by four teenagers none of these guys were over 19. Mm -hmm. um what so what, what are your thoughts well when you see that when I learned about it, it instantly took me back to the possibilities mm -hmm. because of what I experienced. I reported seeing the, the vehicle circling my house. I could easily get gunned down at my house. They, if nothing else, they should investigate, you know, what's mm -hmm. going on. Cause it's a lot of things that don't sound right. Mm -hmm. That just ain't adding up. Mm -hmm. And we all know that they can put whatever spin they want to, but the truth will come out. I just pray that the truth come out and that, you know, if justice is required from an avenue or a path that put her life at risk like that, like what happened to me, I pray that she would get that justice if that's appropriate, because I don't know what's going on, you know, what went on with that. But it just seemed too strange that... Very strange. Why would she be targeted like that? How did they get the gas so fast mm -hmm. and all? You know, mm -hmm. it just... You you have to question stuff mm -hmm. because we cannot be naive to think that corruption in law enforcement does not exist. You, you can't be that, you know, naive 
It, it's just impossible. And like you said, the media, they put out whatever they want. They put out whatever they want. Whoever controls the media controls the narrative. Yeah. So if they don't, you know, like the way they, I was on Eyewitness News and all that stuff. They never were, they never put my face out there. They, I, I had anonymity for some reason, but my husband thing was all, they had his mug shots and all that kind of stuff. They had all his stuff out there, but um, I lost a, a lot in that situation. Um, but I just never, I never believed that I would, end my time on earth without my story being told mm. so sure. i kept all my receipts all these years it's been like 26 27 years you know what i'm saying i still got all of my stuff mm -hmm. so that and we got a movie script we got a screenplay this all of that kind of stuff oh yeah 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 and i want to meet 50 cent yeah i really like him i think 50 go, he go see this interview oh, okay yeah yeah, that he, he, see this. he is like my my um I just love him so much because I look at him as a businessman and he's from the streets mm -hmm. and I could just relate to him. Yeah, I don't want to use the word idol. I don't idol no man, but work. I really admire him. Work. Yeah, so I follow what his work and all that kind of stuff. Well, we shut out in common. 50 yeah. bit. Somebody asked me the other day who your favorite rapper all the time. I told him 50 Cent. 50, yeah. And they tweaked him out like 50. Yeah. I'm like, that's my honest answer. Yeah. Uh, but a couple questions I want to ask you, Rwanda, because uh, I I mentioned the term whistleblower earlier. Yes. For the viewers that's watching it, even for myself, can you tell us what a whistleblower is? Okay. Now, a whistleblower is a person that comes forward with information, evidence of impropriety. So it's like when you see some stuff going on wrong at your job, it's like say you work for uh, the tobacco industry, and you see them putting extra chemical that could kill people in it and you tell on it, you know, it's that kind of thing. So a whistleblower in terms of law enforcement is the person that report the corruption. Okay. And, and it's easy to become, I guess, intertwined in all of the corruption because you really don't, like back then, you didn't really have a lot of oversight. So you could pull somebody over, take their drugs, keep it moving. You ain't got to go turn that shit in. It was just, uh, it was easy to be corrupt. It, it was just easy. It was just a, a breeding ground. And so I can, I can see now in retrospect how all of those people was involved in it. Yeah. So... So let me ask you this, right? With you uh, being a former officer, um, nowadays, like kind of like in a rap world, um, mm -hmm. snitching is mm -hmm. popular, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I'm sure back in your time, the snitch and get stitches phrase was yeah. very popular, right? Yeah, they used to say that. Yeah, so uh, can you, can you, but can you tell us the concept of snitching as far as like police involvement? Do police like, force guys to snitch or, you know, manipulate them to do that, knowing that there's consequences they'll face from the streets? Okay, let's deal with that on two aspects. You have good officers out there that are partnered with them bad officers. It should be a path where if you don't want to ride the dark wave with your corrupt partner, you should be able to get out of that or speak about it without being targeted. That's an avenue for snitching. Mm -hmm. But if you tell the way the culture is, they're going to they, they're going to ostracize you. They're going to put hits out on you and do whatever because they don't want to be exposed. Mm -hmm. But I always believe that police officers should have a path to Talk to somebody and say, hey, this is going in a direction and I can see the end and it's not something that I want to do. And they should be able to do that without being called cowards or snitches or anything like that, because corruption is a choice. You can choose to not participate. And you shouldn't feel like you, as an officer, you shouldn't feel like you compelled to do it because of the cold blue. We all stick together. And see, that's what they did in my situation. They used that cold blue shit 
I don't follow that cold blue shit. We, people, family, us, mm -hmm. the motherfuckers that did all this stuff to me was black, mm -hmm. you know? And what did it benefit them? Chicago all fucked up now, super dangerous and everything. You can, those same officers can't even enjoy the city of Chicago. Cause y'all sat there and didn't do shit when you had an opportunity to do something to help mold the path for Chicago to be great. That, that CAPS program, I think if it had been managed properly and had the right people involved in it, I honestly believe that Chicago would, would not be as bad as it is. Mm. I ain't going to say that you can solve all crime because you got to realize, don't be too naive. Crime is money. For sure. Crime is business. For sure. The courts, the prison systems, all of that kind of stuff. So if you if you end all crime, somebody ain't getting a check. Mm -hmm. Hell no, they don't want you to end all crime. You can just do some surface shit. Mm -hmm. So my thing was, let me do my surface shit. But anyway, on the streets now, when you're talking about snitches from civilians or gang members and all that kind of stuff, at the end of the day, I personally think that if you have information that impacts somebody's life, whether they live or die, whatever, your, your conscience should lead you, not the street code. Not the street code, but that's how I think. That might be a little bit too naive because you could get a bullet in your head. But we all gonna go out some kind of way. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I, I choose to lean towards my conscience. I can't do shit that my conscience don't agree with. Yeah. And so somebody asked me, would you do this again if you ever had to do it over? You know how people ask you? That's what I was gonna ask you. Yeah, <laughs> would you do it again? Man, that's a hard If you could answer. go back to, so well, yeah, well, so I want to know is if you could go back to your friend's house when she was telling you don't say nothing, do you, you know, do you sometimes think, damn, I should never say nothing? Yeah, I had those moments, mm -hmm. but I know, I know the type of person I am. I'm, I'm like brutally honest. Yeah, you had to. I, I'm going to tell you a funny story that shaped my character. When I was living in Inglewood, I was going to William A. Hinton School. I have a twin sisters, Wanda and Rhonda. So um, my mother told us, we were in kindergarten or first grade, and my mother told us, don't take money out of our piggy bank and go to the store on 71st and Parnell because back then they sold penny candy, okay. had in a little bag or whatever. So me and my sister, we're going to commit our first you know, act of disobedience. We went, raid our little piggy bank, and we walking under that viaduct on 71st uh, between normal and... Parnell, it's a long viaduct, it's dark and everything like that. So we walk in under that viaduct to go to the penny store, you know, to get us some stuff from Mr. Jesse's store. So as we were under the viaduct, a bully came out and he robbed us. So he approached us and he said, give me, give me y'all money. I know y'all going to that store. So my sister was like, we don't have no money. We don't have no money. And I said, yes, we do. It's in our socks. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. I get it. <laughs> that's, so that's just always how it was. That was always how it was. It's just like, I'm just brutally honest. Right. I'm just going to say whatever it is. And so that guy made us sit there, take our shoes off, take our socks off, and get all that money out, because we had big old wives, and give it to him. And we just came back home. We got a whooping, of course. But that story <laughs> had never left me. Yeah, yeah, but that shaped my character. That just showed me how I am. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Well, you, you came and you shared your story with us today, and I'm so grateful. Yeah. How do you feel? I feel good that I got it off my chest. I have no idea what to expect going forward. Right. But I really don't. <laughs> I really don't care because, like, on a personal note, I almost died in January from a health condition. And so when I was on my um, death, oh, I'm sorry, when I was uh, in intensive care, I thought about my whole life. And I was like, I still got some unfinished business. I said, we, we, we got this story out here and people going to want to hear it. Mm -hmm. People gonna want to hear it, mm -hmm. and, and it's true, mm -hmm. you know. And I just was like, 
I just got to keep it, you know, I got to keep it alive. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Three weeks, okay, three weeks ago, I couldn't even walk. Really? Couldn't even walk. Look at God. Look at God. And so now I've been in some therapy because I, I lost 70 pounds in one month. Mm. And it took all of my muscles and everything like that. And so I don't have, um, it, it, it messed with my body mass index. And I didn't have any muscle tone or anything like that. And my muscles aren't firing up. It's just the protein in my body began to eat itself. Mm. Or my body began to eat the protein itself or whatever. So anyway, my legs are just like jello. And so I couldn't walk. Mm -hmm. And so I began to walk about three weeks ago. Wow. And then I don't even know how. I didn't reach out to you. I didn't even know that my daughter, you know, was like following my life to this degree because she never really say anything. Because she was a baby at this time, right? She was a baby. And she reached out and told you about my story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I was like, man, how am I going to go and tell my story? You know, I, I can't even sit down. I can't walk. I can't do anything or whatever. And look at God. And look at God. Ooh. Look at God. <laughs> I sat on that airplane on them hard seats because when you ain't got no booty meat, you can feel all of that mm. metal and everything mm -hmm. like that. And for some reason, it was not uncomfortable. Mm. For some reason, it was not a comfortable. So I, I believe that this had to happen. Yeah, it did. It had to happen. Because when, when she reached out, I, I she caught my attention immediately. Mm -hmm. um, I get I get a lot of DMs daily, you know, but it's hers caught my attention immediately. Um, I responded immediately, you know. Mm -hmm. And like I said in the beginning of the interview, after just talking to you for just three minutes on the phone, I could hear the seriousness. Mm -hmm. So when y'all said y'all was coming, I knew y'all was going to be oh, here yeah. on time, too. And they got here on yeah, time. Because we take care of our business and everything mm -hmm. like that. And it's just important <clears throat> for me to get my story out. And mm -hmm. I remember when all of this was happening, I used to say to myself, one day they're going to make a movie about my mm -hmm. life. And I didn't think it was going to take, you know, this long. But we've been in pre preparations. We got the script. It's all copyright and all that kind of stuff. That's what's up. And I've been working on the book and everything like that. And that's just a goal that I'm going to set for myself yeah. to put everything out there so that when I'm long gone, maybe some other officer, you know, could benefit from my story or whatever. Because it's really a story of strength. I'm the type of person, if my car breaks down, I'm going to be crying when the tow truck driver come. I'm like, oh, because I hate breaking down. But when this stuff happened to me, I didn't shed one tear. Mm. And I mean, they was like, you know how you see on TV when they had you in the room with the light and they interrogating you? They was knocking over typewriters and shit. You lying, bitch. You lying. And I just wouldn't. I'd just be sitting there and I just wouldn't break. I wouldn't break. I went and break. They had put devices on our cars. And so um, on my beans, they had a tracking device on it. So they were showing up everywhere I was going when I, like after the shootout, mm -hmm. um, before I got terminated the following year, they would just be following me everywhere. Okay. So after the shootout, you were still working for the police? Okay. What happens is if you um, are involved in any kind of incident, or sh shootout or whatever, you have rights. And so... They take away your police authority on the street and put you in a punishment unit. And while they're while you in the punishment unit, they're adjudicating your case. And so in my case, they were um, it was being investigated by internal affairs. The thing that was wrong with all of this, the police that were involved, the officer that was involved in the shooting with me was an internal affairs officer. Right. His department investigated all of this. So that's not, there was some bias there. And, and the people that was involved in all of this investigated it. Mm. And so it should have been investigated by maybe the state police or something like that. But to have an officer involved shooting with internal affairs, the allegations against internal affairs about being involved in the correction, in the corruption and they are the ones in charge of the investigation that's that's inappropriate no. yeah that's inappropriate i mean it, it's a conflict of interest if nothing else 
because everything that they did, what I eventually got fired for was not for the shootout, anything like that, conduct unbecoming because I married Jeffrey and he had a criminal record. Mm. Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. Wow. I didn't get fired for nothing that I did involving trying to help my life. I got um, fired for my association with my husband. Mm, and they call that conduct unbecoming. Con so yeah, conduct now, were you unbecoming. all married before or y'all yeah. got married? Wow. We, we got married. We got married before all of this stuff happened. I'm saying before you became police? Or? No, no, no. Okay. We got married. We got married. Um, but it was before the situation. Before the situation. We had only been married maybe two years. Okay. When all of this stuff happened. Right. Yeah. But like I said, he did. He did four years and everything. And. It, it just didn't work out after that. You know, we weren't able to sustain with all of that mm -hmm. stuff going on and everything like that. Mm -hmm. But like I said, they tried their best to either kill me or put me in prison. And it just didn't work. And I and I know other officers that were whistleblowers or whatever at Inglewood District. And um, they were treated the, the, the same path that I went through. Yep. Wow. Yeah, I wasn't the only one. One of my friends, he, um, a car actually tried to run him down the sidewalk. Yeah, and it was these same people. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, I, I, I've heard, I've heard somebody say, "Man, it don't be the white people doing this to us. It be our us own. doing it to each other. Yeah, our own kind. Yeah, and it was like a lot of jealousy. It was a lot of jealousy back then, like. People just, you know, be jealous and haters or whatever. And like when we would have those community meetings, the community was really feeling me and I was feeling them. And um, people, the other officers, because they didn't have that rapport, they would be jealous. They would be jealous. I'm going to tell you, I, I, I'm so good with people and young gang members and things like that. When I was a police officer, we would like they would have these big fights at Robeson High School and I would be able to go up there, talk to the gang members on both sides, GDs and uh, BDs and, you know, be able to get them to calm down and stuff like that. When their friends just got shot up or whatever and they they wilding all out, I would be out there uh, in the crowd, in the crowd, out of the squad car. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Trying to to relate to them, hugging them, you know, because it, it's painful. It, we would see death almost every day. And so these young men, uh, they got to process all of that kind of stuff. And so I had developed a real good rapport with the gangs on my beat. Like, and, and it wasn't because, let me see, it wasn't because they feared me or anything like that. It was just some other kind of level or whatever. Cause they would come up to me while I would be sitting on the corner preventing their drug sales. They'll say, Mary J, we rented this spot. You, you, you uh, taking our money, we done already paid rent for this motherfucker. Move your car. And I wouldn't move it. Now, did you catch what I just said? Say it again. They rented the motherfucking corner. Who you rented from? Right. Who you rented from? Right. <laughs> Who the fuck you rented from? <clears throat> they rented, they, they rent now spots on my beat. Mm. I don't know nothing about that. Damn, that's crazy. So I'm sitting there. These little young homies coming there, you know how they be riding them bikes and they got their head turned, like what you doing? They paddling and everything. They sitting right there on the side of me, got a piece right there on me. Mm. Got a piece on me. And for some reason, they just, well, they just wouldn't, it just never happened. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Mary J, get off our spot. I'm like, no. Y'all ain't selling no drugs over here. Why? I say, I, I, I get off in two hours. And you were a, a Chicago police officer that was literally serving and protecting our community. Yep. I believed in what I had taken my oath for. And like I say, they blackballed my black ass. 
I couldn't do anything. After, after I got off the police department, I started with the telephone company. Um, and I didn't even know how to use computers. They didn't even really have computers back then to that level. They had those real big ones mm -hmm. or whatever. But because I was a street cop, I didn't know how to use no computer. Mm -hmm. Shoot, when I went to that interview with um, uh, Ameritech, I lied. I was like, yeah, I know how to use a computer because, shit, I need a paycheck. My right. husband in jail. I got this baby right here. And the police department was so strategic. When I got pregnant, uh, me and Jeff had a child in the midst of all of this. So she was born a year after the shootout. Okay. And so they waited two weeks after I had her to fire me and take away my health benefits. Mm. I pulled my black ass up to the public aid office. When nothing, it was only one parking space at the place. Here I am in a brand new business, parking at the public aid office to go in there and get some food stamps and some medical uh, coverage for my daughter. Wow. See, I, I'm not too proud, you know what I'm saying? I'm a, I'm a victor. Yeah. So whatever the situation is, I'm going to do whatever it is I need to do. So when you pitch it to 50 Cent, what you going to tell him? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> I I honestly I honestly think that anybody involved in this project, mm -hmm. you got to be tough. Yeah. You got to be, you got to be like Jeff. You know what I'm saying? You just can't be fearful or anything like mm -hmm. that. I see Fifty Cent as that type of nigga. Mm -hmm. He just to me come across like. We know he had a, the, the paper, you know, he got the money, whatever. Right. But he seemed like the type, he ain't gonna let nobody back him down. If he see, if he see my receipts mm -hmm. and see, damn, she really did go through this shit. Mm -hmm. He don't seem like the type that would sell me out. That's why I like him. Yeah. He seemed like he just a real nigga. Yeah. I wanted to ask you one more thing about the um, police though, right? Um, are those persons that you had interaction with back then still working for Chicago police now? Um, most of them have retired or passed away. Um, I like the Clifton guy. He was, he was still have been there right. cause he just got arrested, you know, not too long ago mm -hmm. and they let him, you know, they got him off the police department. I would be interested to know if he was still able to keep his pension though, which I think would be terrible. Why should tax you know, why should he still get the benefit of that, having committed all of those crimes and everything? But then they take mine away and I never committed a crime. Right. And remember, um, the reasoning for firing me was because I was married to a person that had a, a, a felony, mm -hmm. conduct unbecoming. Mm -hmm. And you, you're going to strip me of everything, but you leave this guy, he's your bad guy, your bag, B-A-G, collecting your money or whatever, you leave him still to do his dirt and you're gonna reward him with a pension. If that's the case, even after he's committed these crime, violent crimes against these women, somebody's just start looking at all of that. It's just, it's just unacceptable. Yeah. 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 This is crazy because I never heard nothing like this before. I know, that's why this is a story that it had to it had to come back to Chicago because you got to understand Chicago to understand what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm like I, I have pitched my idea and my script and everything for California. And, but this is a Chicago story. Yeah. Yeah. It's a Chicago yeah. story. Yeah. Yeah. So you said they used to call 71st and Parnell P Street? P Street. Okay. Mm -hmm. P Street. So that and that's where I grew up at. Yeah. And it's, the, it's a building, 7,000 South Parnell. Mm -hmm. And that's where we grew up. And and like I say, I I love Chicago. I love Inglewood. It was so much fun when I was growing up. I would never have known that I would be a police officer there. Even the grammar school that I went to from Kindergarten up to sixth grade was right on my beat. Right. And so every day I got a chance to patrol the area where I went to school mm -hmm. and, you know, make sure kids weren't ditching school and different things like that. And that just gave me so much uh, uh, 
it was just comforting and just a, a sense of a community. You right. Know, so connection. you basically knew all the people that I knew them. That's the yeah, whole. You that's kind of grew why. Up with them, right? Yeah. That's why I'm in this situation because people knew me and they trusted me. The community trusted me, and so they gave me their information. Right. So that they wasn't a snitch. Right. They gave it to me and and you know most of them wanted me to deal with it. Miss Curtis was the lady that was like, don't say nothing, you know, don't say anything. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, people wanted the stuff, you know, handled, managed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, this is, uh, like I said, it's quite the story. So, but tell us, how did you move forward, though? Afterwards, you know, um, you end up having to relocate. Yeah, you I felt like. I, I felt like I had to leave, leave this area, or whatever, because I just needed to get my head space right. I'm a new mom because I had my daughter. I had my daughter um, a year after the shootout, right. and so um, I just I didn't want to be depressed and everything like that because it was just going through what I went through. I didn't feel comfortable moving in Chicago because I couldn't, I wasn't able to carry a gun anymore. Mm -hmm. And I was still under the threat of retribution from possibly Michael Clifton or whoever else was involved in it because I gave up a lot of information. You know, there's a, a lot of information that was provided, video evidence, all of that kind of stuff. And so I didn't know what somebody else would plan or whatever. Right. Even when Michael Clifton was um, picked up and those videos were out with him running from the reporters and everything, mm -hmm. um, it got back to me uh, that I should not speak on it. I should just, my shit didn't happen, leave it alone or whatever. Right. And I'm like, fuck that. And don't be fucking threatening me. Mm -hmm. And so even now, I just honestly believe that I just can't be silent no more. Right. I've been silent too long. Right. And in, in my silence allows this culture, yep. this environment to thrive. Yep. And so I'm yep. speaking up. Yep. And, I, yeah. and I'm glad you're speaking up because too much of this be swept under the rug. Yep. It's been under that rug too long. It's time to lift it up, package it up, put it out there. Mm -hmm. It's the truth. Mm -hmm. Yep. And what they say, the truth always, always come to light. What's done in the dark will always come to light. Yes. That's what yes. they say. And then with this, it's a it's an old story, but it's still fresh to me because yeah. it's my life. And this know? type of stuff is obviously still occurring. And it's still occurring, yes. But the devaluation of females on law, in law enforcement, because if that's the pattern that's going on, you, you taking these women, y'all taking them out. If that's the pattern that's going on, somebody got to deal with that. I know I was personally devalued. My life didn't have any value. Mm -hmm. And that became obvious to me from the day that a, a gangbanger reports to my supervisor, my immediate supervisor, that there's a hit and he calls me, that supervisor calls me, tells me about it, the citizen gangbanger walks up, he reiterates the story or whatever. They let my sergeant tell me, go to the station, you could take the rest of the day off. I'm like, okay, wow, you know, they taking this serious. That's what I thought right then and there. I'm and like, the next day you say they uh, put then you the up. next day I come in, I look at the schedule, 732. You got me 99, which means by myself, back on that same uh, beat, P Street. Let's just call it P Street. Back going to P Street by myself. And, I, and I'm thinking when I got in that day that they was going to say, oh, you, you working inside. You, you going to be on the desk. And that was just so hurtful to me. And so then when I went back and asked them, they were like, get your ass back out there. Mm. Yeah. So, so I can speak personally to being devalued. And I feel like the police department owe me, a, the Chicago Police Department being specific, owe me an apology for that. Now, moving forward, when, I'm, when I 
decided to leave, I just started all over. I started from scratch. I worked my way up through the phone company. I became a pro certified project manager. I became um, a manager, a high level manager. I, I managed a repair garage for the phone company. I had like 75 people sometimes that would be under my direct supervision. And then from there, I just began to just pursue my individual business um, concerns and things like that. And I just opened up my own thing, yeah. did my own thing. But then when I moved to my current location, I started out with their local police department. And, um, and I'm in Houston. I'm not afraid to say that. I'm in Houston and I went um, and tried to get on the Houston Police Department, but I had just missed the cutoff age. It was 44 and I had just turned 45 when I got down there. Mm -hmm. And so um, I ended up working um, as a police service officer. It's way down the chain, $11 an hour, virtually pushing a mail cart through the station or whatever. And um, the officers there, 50-50, half of them were decent, half of them were assholes or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I remember that um, an officer that knew my story, he don't come to me in a real insulting way, like the, because of the job that I was performing. Mm -hmm. I had to check in people that were coming to a community event because I still was working community kind of related stuff down in Houston. Mm -hmm. And so he said, I need you to check these people in. He said, you're going to check off their last names, you know, like A, B, C, D. They talk to you like you're slow. Yeah. <laughs> like I got to look at the sheet, find a last name It's organized. A, B, C, D. I guess that made him feel good, you know, to try to put me down like that or whatever. It just, just stupid shit. Right. And so I put up with a lot of disrespect from other officers and everything because of the shit that the Chicago Police Department put out there. I had to deal with the, the fallout from it. People just weren't respecting me. And I didn't like that. Like I say, at the end of the day, what I would like is a, a formal apology and some kind of compensation. And a bag. And a bag. Good. Yep. And a bag. I never gave, gave up hope on a bag. I just could never find an attorney that had the balls to take on the Chicago Police Department. Most of these motherfuckers and everything, they all in cahoots because... Like, not only was the corruption, like I say, all the way to IAD, but now you got to branch it off to the courts and the attorneys and all of that shit, too. So, you know, it's just like whatever they want to do, they pretty much going to do. And so if they ain't going to be your ride or die and try to help you out, that's just not going to help. But the Fraternal Order of Police, they had my back. I really appreciate them. I, I believe that they operated in such a level of integrity I have to you know say thank you for that because they could have went along with this bullshit like everybody else did they was the only ones that did stand by me and did what was right yeah fraternal fraternal order yeah. of police the FOP okay. they they weren't corrupted by all of this stuff they were aware prior to my shootout of the danger that I was in because I kept going to them saying that the police department has me working in the same area uh, and I need to be inside or reassigned and things like that. And so they were trying to help me with that and they were aware of my story. So when it all popped off, they were like, you know, nah, you ain't doing this shit. You know, we got to help this officer. Yeah. yeah. Remember your days when they used to uh, call you gladiator? Oh, yeah, I remember them <laughs> days. I earned that name, though. I earned that name, though. I just was determined I wasn't going to let nobody beat my ass. I was little. You know, I'm still little. So did you now. get into a lot of fights? Yeah. Man, I done had hundreds of fights. Really? Yeah. And then I used to have to tell the officers that w when we would be out there, and this was years before all of this stuff happened, like, if I'm, if I'm right in it, and I'm beating the nigga ass or whatever. Don't be behind me trying to pull me off because I've injured officers because they would come trying to break it up. 
you know, don't touch me when I'm in my zone. Let me deal with what I'm dealing with. But yeah, I used to beat a nigga ass in a minute or whatever, because it was going to either be them or me. And I wasn't letting nobody beat my ass. That was how it was. We ain't pull guns on people like how these coward cops be doing and stuff like that. We used to just scrap, you know, and then we go in the station, everybody, you know, talking or whatever. And it's cool. It wasn't never done to that instantly just pull a gun on a person. They ain't even did nothing. And you just pulling your gat out on them right away. We never did that stuff. The training that I received back then, I think it was way better than this stuff that they've given these officers now. Yeah, and, but, and we didn't even have tasers. They, they, they weren't even invented when I was a cop. What, what, what was the training process like? Um, it was a thorough training. You know, they trained you on the use of force. You had classroom training, you had physical training. Um, you had uh, to go through different um, uh, psychological kind of evaluations and things like that. You had to know the law, and that was a big part of it. It's just knowing the, the law, things like that. And so um, the physical training was really hard because they didn't make a separation between women training and men training. We had to all be trained together, you know, and you just had to fight. Yeah, you just had to fight and do whatever you, you know, had to do to, to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. So were you ever in a situation where you had to use your weapon? Um, the As an officer? I've been in situations where I had to pull my weapon out. And fortunately, I didn't have to fire it. But then I was involved in that shootout. Right. But yeah, I would have to pull my weapon out sometimes because, you know, you you going to run into them situations or whatever. Yeah. And I remember one time we my partner and I had pulled the man over and he was drunk and we were wrestling with him and um, he had a gun. But uh, we were able to take it from him before it escalated, you know, to anything like that. And then I remember sometimes, too, uh, being a woman having to work with older men. I remember um, I was with a field training officer and that's when you first come out the academy and they have you with an older person and they, you know, trying to show you the ropes. And so we had pulled over a person in a, in a Camaro, a little small kind of compact car. And I was searching the car and um, my training officer told me to go in there and search, looking for drugs, guns, any paraphernalia, things like that. And he allowed the person that was the driver of the car to walk up on me while I was in the car searching on my hands and knees. Mm -hmm. And I catch sight that this nigga walking up on right. me and everything like that. So I got into it with my field training officer. And that was early in my career, like when I first was assigned to that unit. And I think because I had the balls to speak up for myself, mm -hmm. it kind of blackballed me with the white officers okay. or whatever initially because I spoke up for myself. Okay. I guess in their eyes, I was supposed to just take that shit. But I'm not going to be in a car searching and got my gun with this person can, you know, attack me from the back or whatever. And as an officer, you're supposed to be watching the other officers back. And that shit just wasn't happening. Yeah. And so I think that that set a course for a lot of the Caucasian officers at my district to just kind of like have a little beef with me or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Do you think a lot of men on the job were intimidated by you? Um, Not to the sense where I'm making myself prideful or anything like that, but I think that they were intimidated by my strength and by my intelligence. Okay. I think that- you was a bodybuilder. Yeah, and I so was you a were bodybuilder. In shape. I was in shape. I was in, I was in- So you was walking shape. around, you was looking, you was looking good. I was a bad bitch, yeah, I ain't gonna lie. Yeah, yeah. I was a bad bitch, I had my stuff together and like, I had guns, you know how? Yeah. Guns, all of that so stuff. So I imagine if a nigga couldn't get with you, he was hating on you, you know? The women hating on the nigga that was with you. Yeah, the women were hating on me. The men, you know, were hating on me. And see, I wasn't that type of uh, chick that would um, fuck her way through the police department, even <laughs> though I could have. That just wasn't me. Now, I might deal with my coworkers or whatever, but I just wasn't the type that was just going to make my advance in 
the department based off of screwing niggas and stuff. That just wasn't me. Mm -hmm. And so I had beef with a lot of other women that was doing that because mm -hmm. that was common. Yeah, people come in and, you know, a woman come in and that's how she going to get up. But I wasn't like that. I was just a basic beat cop. Yeah. So it was drama in that workspace just like any other. It was. It was. I remember the first time that I realized that the police department could do anything it wanted to do. When I was... Um, when I was a young officer, maybe two, three years in, mm -hmm. I got assigned to the um, tactical unit. I, I had broken my leg and I was working there as the secretary. And so it was a all pretty much uh, all male unit and I was the secretary. So when I started working there, I would come in and they would have these Playboy books all on my desk, you know, showing women's private parts and all that kind of stuff, just inappropriate things. And it would be on my desk and they would think it would be funny, you know, putting all this sex stuff on my desk. So I made a complaint about it. Mm -hmm. So they found out that I complained about it because I complained to the EEOC because like when I would, if something got to a point where I had to start complaining, remember I document everything. So they found out that I did that. So they really started bothering me. So these two um, white uh, tactical officers, we're going to call them rock and roll, they uh, began <laughs> to call my number, call my home, leaving voicemails, calling me a cunt and a bitch and all of that kind of stuff. This is my first official report to the police department about being harassed. And I had the recordings because back then it was, um, it was a company that kept the recordings of the voicemails. Okay. So I make the police report. They're going to use the evidence of these voicemails, you know, as part of my case. All of a sudden, we can't find your voicemails. Mm. They, they wiped them away. Mm. And that's how I first discovered they could do anything, they could do they anything that they want to do. And it was just like pretty much after that, you know, I just had to watch, you know, watch how I moved through the department or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I was on a roll just before all of this happened because I was ready to be promoted <clears throat> to be a sergeant. sergeant. And I honestly believe that with my intelligence and my skill set and my people skills, that if I have been allowed to remain on the police department unscathed by all of this, that I would have been, you know, up in the higher rankings and things like that of the Chicago Police Department. Mm -hmm. I just feel like that was po a possibility for me. Yeah. Yeah. So when we when we when we put this movie together, who you want to be playing you? My daughter. You know okay. how they did, how 50 did with um, Big Meech mm -hmm. and his son? Because y'all look just alike. Because we look just alike. And my yeah. daughter, she, you know, she, she, yeah, she, she good. Yeah, she, she I good. I can see that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, we had talked about that. Okay. That's why, I, that's why I really would love to be able to just discuss it, even consult with 50 on how to manage this going forward, you know, because it's a lot. And I don't want to. I don't want to move being naive with all of this stuff because, OK, what do I need to be preparing for when I leave here? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. Now, like I say, I'm almost 60. I'm, I, I'm not walking in no fear. Mm -mm. If the Chicago Police Department trying to come and retaliate because I spoke about my stuff, which is real, which is true, which is documented, it's not no lie. If they want to try to come after me, it's like, whatever. But I'm not going to be living in no fear, living in the shadows or anything like that. They done just took so much away from me because I'm not the same person that... I used to be when I first joined the police department, you know, I was just vibrant and just full of life and everything like that. But having to deal with this, it make you where you just can't trust nobody. It don't matter if they white or black, it be grimy niggas be coming, trying to see what's going on and all that kind of stuff. So you just got to always have your guards up. And that's why even if when this project goes forward, I just want to make sure that the right people are involved. And this is going to take some strong 
men and women that are not afraid of the Chicago Police Department system. They're not afraid of that system because it, you know, it's going to try to fuck you up, you know, but I survived it. I'm victorious over that. And I don't really know of any other women that have survived an attack from the Chicago Police Department and can come 26 years later with her receipts. I don't, I don't, I don't see no competition, you know, out there on somebody with my story because I survived it and it's real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What I like about your story the most is life comes at you fast. Yeah. It seems like one thing led to another and it just escalated so quickly. It did. It did. I wouldn't. Have, so back to our original conversation, would I, if, if I had it to do over, would I do it again? Mm -mm. Hell no. no. It's your story. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't see wisdom in that. Mm -hmm. You know what, what the saddest part of this thing is? I went and drove back over there on Parnell, over there where I was, my beat and all that kind of stuff. Hey, shit improved. It looked the same. It looked the same. Mm. It looked the same. You and just you drove back through that today? I mean, like since you've been yeah. in Chicago? It just, wow. it's just, it's sad when you almost gave your life trying to help and it didn't help. It didn't, it didn't do anything. Yep, it didn't do anything. And, and, and like I say, all of the people I reported this stuff to, I got fired for conduct unbecoming. The FBI guy that I was supposed to meet with came to my hearing. But he gave one of them um, classic, generic responses. Well, it was early. It was early in the investigation, and so we never had any opportunity to confirm or discuss anything with her because of the shootout. So he never one of them politically yeah one of them politically answers. correct answers and everything <clears throat> like that. But I'm like, you know what? At the end of the day, I did you know I did something that I can stand on. But me doing it again, hell no. Right. Hell no. Because I lost houses, cars, mm -hmm. career. Mm -hmm. Like I say, I was getting ready to be a, <clears throat> excuse me, getting ready to be a uh, sergeant. sergeant. And I lost that opportunity. And I was upset about that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so for the, for the young ladies that's watching, or even um, young men as well, there's somebody watching that's interested in becoming... Chicago police. Mm -hmm. uh, what's some advice you could give to them? Wow. Well, go in. If, if that's your passion, pursue it. Because <clears throat> we do need representation from us. Um, pursue it, but go in with the full understanding of what you're dealing with. Don't let them brainwash you and convince you that they're going to always have your back. It's a brotherhood and all that kind of stuff. And if it's shit going on that you don't want to be a part to, don't be a part to it. You should still be able to have your own conscience rule you when you're doing, you know, your work every day. And we see it all too many times. These old bad cops doing stuff to people that they shouldn't be doing. And it's other police officers standing right there and don't intervene. And so, you know, don't be that follower, you know, set your own path. And know that it's corruption out there. Mm -hmm. But shoot, if, if, if I was younger, because um, I'm almost 60, I'd be 60 in November. Okay. If I was a younger woman and um, was still in law enforcement, man, I would love to have come back and figured out some kind of way to revamp that community policing because it, it's, it's something missing. It's a huge part of this is missing, and that's that contact and connection and communication between the public and the police. And part of that is because they're in the car. You know, it's easy to patrol, you know, from your car, but you get your ass out there walking that foot patrol, you know. 
And people like when when we were asked to do it, I did it because I liked it. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the police officers was bucking against it. And it's very rare to see police on foot oh, nowadays. Yeah. yeah, but I the people knew me. Very rare. They knew me by my name or Mary J or whatever. And so they used to say, we see her all the time. And we don't see nobody else, you know. And, and so the other officers would get mad. But, you know, that's on them. I got out the car. I didn't take the flyers that we were supposed to hand out to the citizens and put them in the trunk of my car and after the shift, throw them in the garbage can. I didn't do that. I gave them out. Yeah. Aside from your story and aside from Chicago police, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at the end of the day, you are a woman, a woman with a family, you know. Um, and as you as you mentioned, you've been having health issues mm -hmm. um, as you're getting older. So before you leave, can you just leave with us um, some of the most valuable things you've learned throughout okay. the years? Um, okay. You know, not just pertaining to the situation, but throughout life. OK, well, the first thing that I learned is pursue your dreams. Don't be fearful of doing what it is you feel in your heart you were called to do. And I'm speaking towards my decision to, to um, delay law school. It's been delayed a long time. And then when I finally did go to law school, I got sick and I'm on a medical leave. But I, I would tell people, pursue your dreams. And then another thing that I teach people that I mentor is if you having problems figuring out what it is you were put on this earth to do, Dig deep in yourself and look for a problem that you can easily solve, but somebody else had to pay to get that problem solved. Mm. Yeah, I solve hard problems for a living. I do immigration, okay. one of the hardest areas of law. I solve hard problems. That's why I make a lot of money mm. because the problem that they bring to me, they can't solve it. Solving a food problem, being a fast food worker, that's why you don't make a lot of money. But solving a medical problem, that's a hard problem. You specialize, that's why you make money. So my advice is to find the problem that you can solve naturally, easy. You, don't, you grieve the answer. Then you know you're on the right path to your destiny. Oh, I like that. That's I like good. that a lot. That's good. I see your face all day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that a lot. Yep. But that, that's been the biggest, I think that's been the biggest thing that has helped people that I've mentored is, is for them to figure out what it is they were placed on this planet to do. Mm -hmm. And so I know that me, I'm a motivational speaker. Mm -hmm. um, I can do law naturally. It's just, even when I was little, I always wanted to be a lawyer or a judge. Law for me just come easy. How I knew what to tell the judge in the courtroom, how I knew what to, you know, how to handle all these other little things and everything, how I was directing what was going on, you know, uh, in terms of the legal things with the cases that they were trying to bring against me. And, but that's because it's a natural gift. Yeah. And so people call me. It's a hard problem. I know how to solve it. You're going to pay. Yeah. yeah. Well, Rwanda, thanks again. I'm so glad I was able to come get I'm my so story glad you out. Came. Hey, 50. <laughs> <laughs> uh, shout out to the Beer Boss for sponsoring this episode. Fellas, shout out with the Beer Boss. Use DJU TV as the promo code. That's how you get 20% off. Like, comment, subscribe. Um, shout out to Royalty Productions. I think this is a classic. What you think, Rwanda? Man, <laughs> I think you about to blow up. Yeah, you about to blow up. <laughs> DJ, you go crazy. <laughs>